the Federal Reserve is moving to slow inflation. That is going to have collateral damage along the way. The Fed is going to be between a rock and a hard place. Inflation is going to be high and they're going to find it very hard, I think, even to pause, let alone cut. We're down to now we're kind of debating we're pricing zero versus 25. And I think that's very, very rational at this point. The Fed will need to maintain credibility, will need to save face, but at the same time, dial back their hawkishness. If the markets are in serious distress, pausing is OK. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Moments ago, Credit Suisse trading at 199. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen and Lisa Abramowitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. <coughs> Equity futures stateside on the S&P 500 down by eight tenths of one percent. Credit Suisse down by ten percent. Tom trading just above two Swiss francs this morning. And the deposits are not going to Bank of America, which is another story in America. Is this related to American banking? No, but it also is. There's a trust and confidence issue and you're seeing that. I looked at some fancy, fancy Bloomberg Terminal uh, bid and ask dynamics, and this is a question, John, where the headlines on CSFB, the buyers went on strike. So we've heard from the chairman this morning, and we can talk about that in a moment. We've also heard from one of the top shareholders in Credit Suisse, Saudi National Bank. The chairman says state assistance is not a topic. Not a topic. We spoke to a shareholder about 30, 40, 50 minutes ago who said they will absolutely not provide more assistance to the bank. There is this regulatory story of being a shareholder in a company lease of more than 10 percent. They don't want to cross that line. That's part of it, though. This is a Saudi National Bank chairman who is speaking on Bloomberg Television. He said the answer is absolutely not in terms of investing more in this bank for many reasons outside the simplest reason, which are which is regulatory and statutory, not exactly a vote of confidence in this bank. You're seeing credit default swaps price in the greatest chance of default in the companies uh, in, in the data going back to early 2000. How much do we see some sort of threshold moment or can they keep chugging along with this idea that they've got a three year plan and they're going to stick with it? We spoke to the CEO yesterday and Lisa, to your point, not exactly a ringing endorsement from one of your top shareholders this morning, Tom. The CEO said things were calm. The inflows were there on Monday to be seen. We don't know the story of net inflows or net flows for that matter. And we need to get some of that information. Tom, fact of the matter is they believe they're going to make progress in Q1. We won't really find that out until we get earnings on April 27th. It's a com it's a complexity. And what we saw yesterday is a traditional CEO that wants to stay in control by talking out the timeline. Nobody has that luxury right now. I mean, it's just not there. You have to talk about the clear and present dangers that they have. We started out by saying, is this just an add-on to what we had seen in the U.S.? It is not. This is a specific story of a bank that's been struggling for quite a while. But it raises a question of what kind of pressures there are that build up, that create a scenario that make it very difficult for central banks to respond to the economic story at hand if they're dealing with nodes of financial distress. Having the luxury of reorganizing in good times, Tom, is not their luxury that often arrives to some of these banks. They often face stress at tough times, and things are arguably getting tougher. Yeah. For financial institutions worldwide. Well, they are. I mean, you know, we've got some great guests lined up today to take this forward day one. But can we state that there's all clear in American small and regional banking this morning? I'm not there yet. After I, one day? I, after one day, you know, there's sort of an all. I mean, the equity markets did well yesterday. And I'm looking at some of the spreads that are doing better. Three months to two year is doing a little better. Some nuances here, but I'm just not to all clear out front of retail sales later. And not for me to say, we're only a day into this, Tom, a day into a bounce. Let's see if we get day two, day three, day four. And to your point, <clears throat> still going to get through the data. And then, Tom, we've got to get through next week. The Federal Reserve decision just around the corner, too. Well, yeah, and what's that going to be? Ethan Harris in the in the top there from Bank of America talking up, pop, you know, could we see a pause? I would say the zeitgeist right now is 25 beeps. Do we all agree on that? You know, Possibly. I, think, I would say it's very, very yeah. split. I would say it's very, very split. I could go through the names, Wells Fargo, Goldman, Barclays, Sam Paws. I can pick out others that are saying 25 basis point hike. B of A is one, City's another, Lisa Morgan Stanley one too. A lot of people, including Jason Furman of Harvard, came out and said if it weren't for what we saw in the regional banks, it would be a discussion about why not go 50 basis point. The data is coming in hot enough to justify a move. The question is just whether, to your point, John, we see more distress. Have we seen the end of this? And does that change the narrative substantially? Credit Suisse again, a break of two, trading very briefly at 199, right there just sitting on two Swiss francs, 199.75. 
ugly stuff. Elsewhere, equity futures down about eight tenths of one percent on the S and P. The bid comes back into Treasuries, yields are lower by ten basis points, three fifty eight forty six. Seeing a similar story over in Germany at the front end of the curve, the two year two seventy five yields are lower at the front end of the curve in Germany by fourteen or fifteen basis points. Bit of euro weakness in the mix as well here, Lisa. Euro dollar one zero six eighty four. Today we get a data dump and you know a lot of people used to think that this was actually important before we were worried about the banking system. Now at 8.30 a.m. perhaps people will shrug it off as they have some of the other economic data. We get retail sales for the month of February. We also get U.S. PPI as well as March U.S. Empire Manufacturing which is always interesting as a first look at March. Do people keep spending? This to me is the key question. With the same robustness even though real wages are still deeply negative. Wages are not keeping up with the pace of inflation. So at what point does that eat into the demand that's fueled a lot of the inflation. At 10 a.m. we get the March NAHP housing market index, home builder sentiment at a time where mortgage rates are near 7 percent. How much do you see it rebounding anyway? This idea that perhaps there is room to tighten more and it won't disrupt certain markets substantially that have already felt a bit of pain. And today the earnings that we get including uh, include Manchester United which you know in another moment perhaps we would talk about in terms of their potential sale in the Glazer family. Also Adobe after the bell. I'm curious to see the bifurcation between the haves and the have nots, the market share consolidation in the tech giants. As we see, all of the tech giants have had a different story this year. We hear about more job cuts. We hear about perhaps a little bit over enthusiasm in cloud computing, John. Just the earnings will tell a story that perhaps is more consistent than the macro winds that keep blowing in all directions. Lisa, thank you. The focus firmly elsewhere right now, as you know, Credit Suisse down 11 percent at 198. We all, of course, know some fantastically talented people at that institution right now facing a very, yes. very difficult time. Peter Chair, head of macro strategy at Academy Securities, joins us. Pete, let's talk about it. 197, I think we're all sort of glued on the intraday chart, tick for tick at the moment. Pete, what's your take on what's unfolding? You know, I'm watching the CDS market. We've seen the one year jump to, say, eight to nine points up front. So someone has to pay eight or nine percent of principal to ensure the credit risk for a year. Part of that's concerning because you're starting to see the curve invert. So there's a bid for front end CDS. Having said that, I think two things that are mitigating that are liquidity is still just abysmal. So liquidity is low. European credit default swap liquidity is not what it once was. So the moves can be exaggerated. And it is a name that people hold so much that they do need to hedge. People have been playing around in the Cocos, various uh, parts of the cap structure. So you do get this volatility. It is a bit concerning, though, that at every you know, it seems to be reaching new highs in terms of CDS spreads. So I'm watching that. And I think one lesson all the U.S. banks should be taking is when it comes to capital raising, you have to be aggressive and get it done early, right? This seems to be today's story is about not raising capital maybe a few months ago, and that's what's hurting them today. I think every U.S. bank that's kind of in that weaker end should be thinking, how do I raise capital? Because we in the U.S. have to fill that big void of the unmarked, uh, you know, unrealized losses in treasuries. Pete, some financial institutions that some people had never heard of were declared systemically important by regulators in order to make depositors whole over the weekend in America. How would you describe the importance of Credit Suisse to the financial system? You know, it's an incredibly important company. It's a awesome company. It's, as you say, we all know people who are there. I think we need to see this get resolved because the one thing we do tend to see unfortunately is if one gets into trouble people very quickly start looking oh what's the next one that looks remotely like this and it may be unfair but that's kind of the pattern we saw during the european debt crisis during the great financial crisis i think we just saw it here in the regional banks so this has to be a priority for the ecb right. and yes to get together peter i just want to cut to the chase here on contagion i'm looking at deutsche bank i'm looking at the retail french giant bmp paribas same idea they give way as well peter we don't have time for the tech dynamics but it is grim there's no other way to put it with uh, john help me here a 194 1.9405 on credit suisse do you look at this is a eu regulatory contagion or is it contained to zurich it should be contained to Zurich. But again, I think just like the Fed was, the ECB has to acknowledge that they've got to ring fence things and make sure that they put enough firewalls in place actually to help CS, let CS get time, but more importantly, to ensure that there's no chance of this attracting the attention of other banks and you know people pushing on them. That's what happened in the U.S. It's happened in the past. 
So, I, I, and I do like what the regulators did in the U.S. I think they were very aggressive on Sunday night. I think there's more to do. They've got to address the core problem, which again is these huge unrealized losses. But it's a step in the right direction. It starts ring fencing it and making sure that people understand there is time for these things to work out. The core problem is also, though, that regulators missed some of the red flags, not only uh, with respect to Credit Suisse and so now having to go back and rethink some of the uh, statements as the SEC raised flags, but also over in the U.S., where there wasn't even a chief risk officer at SVB. I'm wondering, from your perspective, at what point does the market lose faith in the ability of regulators to flag risks that might emerge next? You know, it's... I think one of the problems that we face is the regulators that often get caught fighting the last battle, and the great financial crisis was all about the big banks, and that's where the focus was. And clearly, we've got to do more to make sure that everyone's well managed, everyone's staying within limits. Um, you know, I think the things that they did by the surface looks completely allowed to do. Now, why you would want to take that much duration risk, that's a separate question. Uh, Pete, I know you like the mid-sized lenders in the United States, particularly after what you heard on Sunday evening. European banks have been a massive trade. And if we can step away from Switzerland just for a moment, Socgen's down 8%, BNP's down 8%, ING's down 6.5%. Pete, can you say the same thing about the European lenders in this moment they faced this morning? Not yet. I prefer the US right now because I think it was way overdone. It was a very isolated case and the regulators come out quickly. So I want to see some sense that the regulators and the ECB are coming out and doing what they can then I think it's a buying opportunity. Again, it's been a great run. So I'm much more comfortable right now with the U.S. and the mid-market banks. That's where I want. If anything, I expect news over the weekend where you see some progress from some of these banks and shoring up their capital, whether it's through a merger or getting an infusion. That would be great for the market. So I like that. Europe, I think we got to see where this plays out. It's too early. Hey, Pete, thank you, sir. As always, Peter Chair there of Academy Securities. Let's get you up to speed. Credit Suisse, one 89. The stock is down by 15%. It's not just a Swiss story. It's a Europe-wide story. Eurozone banks getting hammered. Sockgen down 8%. BNP down 7.8%. The news of this morning surrounded the stock. The name Credit Suisse. The chairman says state assistance is just not a topic. His words. What you've heard from a major shareholder, the top shareholder, Saudi National Bank. Interested to say this out loud. They will not provide assistance to Credit Suisse. A lot of reasons. One of them is the regulatory story of going above 10% as a shareholder. That's the latest this morning. Credit Suisse is lower off the back of all of this by 15, 16%. Lower the session is where we are right now. 189, 188, the low 187. Coming up, Nouria Rabini. Looking forward to that conversation. 7.30 Eastern time, about one hour and 20 minutes away. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. The Pentagon says a Russian fighter jet collided with a U.S. surveillance drone in international airspace above the Black Sea, causing the American aircraft to crash. Russia's defense ministry denies the claim. The U.S. European Command says the warplane struck the propeller of the Reaper drone. The State Department is calling it, quote, a brazen violation of international law. About half a million British workers are striking today as unions stage a mass walkout. Time to disrupt Chancellor of the Exchequer Jeremy Hunt's annual budget. Now, teachers, junior doctors, civil servants, and workers on the London Underground are expected to join picket lines with rallies and marches planned near Downing Street and the Houses of Parliament. The Capitol subway is effectively shut down over a pension, working and conditions and dispute. Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida will meet with the head of the country's largest labor union today to try to encourage employers to raise wages. The talks have been attracting extra attention since Kishida called on companies to boost pay as part of his so-called new capitalism policy, asking for raises that exceed inflation, which is at a four-decade high. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. The answer is absolutely not, for many reasons, outside the simplest reason, which is regulatory and statutory. We now own 9.8% um, of the bank. If we go above 10%, all kinds of new rules kick in, whether it be by our regulator or the European regulator or the Swiss regulator. 
and we're not inclined to get into a new regulatory regime. That is the Saudi National Bank chairman ruling out further assistance to Credit Suisse, and we'll get into the nature of those comments in just a moment. Credit Suisse right now, and let's get straight to the chart. 183. We are lower by 18%. That is a session low. It is a record low. And elsewhere, you're seeing this really starting to hurt risk appetite worldwide. And we can start with the equity market in the United States. Equity futures on the S&P down around about 1%. Yields are lower by 11 basis points on a U.S. 10-year, 357.51, not just on 10s, but on 2s, down about 9 basis points to 4.16. Want to have a little look at some European banks as well. Outside of Switzerland, let's go to France. Sogchen, down 8%. BNP, down 7.4%. This was the trade, Tom, the trade <clears throat> year to date, before the last week or so, was getting long European lenders and... They're finding themselves in a little bit of difficulty this morning. Off of the U.S., but now aggressively off of the Credit Suisse news, and basically as a generalization back to November and December. We're not in the speed of the show this morning, folks, and with a wonderful guest we've got coming up, going to dive into the details. But let me just say we did get just moments ago new selling pressure on Credit Suisse breaking out to where it was an hour ago. But, John, I want to make clear off the wonderful dynamics of the Bloomberg Terminal the buyers are on strike. With that statement by that shareholder, the buyers in mass walked away. In many ways, it's obvious that you face new regulatory scrutiny, a new regime once you go above 10% as a shareholder in a business <coughs> in many jurisdictions. And Lisa, we understand that. It's kind of strange that he said it out loud in the way he did on a morning like this after a week we've had. You mean because he basically is torpedoing his own investment? I mean, basically, that's essentially what he's doing, because not only did he say it's not just a regulatory issue, they don't want it for other reasons as well. It raises a question why, to your point, but also this importance that it's not just one big investor. It's the big investors that people hoped would ultimately be the white knights, the Middle Eastern investors that would have some other reason to come in and shore, uh, shore up this bank, and they just basically are saying, nope. The technical term is a volatility halt. That's often what happens when stocks drop too much. Tom, we're down by 18% and we have paused. 183 on a stock on Credit Suisse. We're down with the convexity, the second derivative here, looking at it on 10-minute intervals across the last two hours ago, is a new acceleration lower. John, you and I saw just before we went to air the breach of 2.00 Swiss francs, and the bottom line is this is sped up to where you have a halt. The CEO said things were calm yesterday. He said inflows <clears throat> were coming into the bank I, uh, on Monday. We weren't really clear on whether that was net inflows or not. He said they hoped they'd make progress in Q1. And I think we all sat around the table at the time and said, to find that out and wait until April 27th, Tom, that feels like a long, long time. It was a long time. Yeah, it was way out to April. And Francine Lacroix's defense, she tried to drag him kicking and screaming into a CEO present analysis, and she couldn't get there. He wanted to stay focused on, you tell me, April, May, June? When you're like when you're like this, even at three francs per share, April, May, June doesn't matter. Well, it's also got to lead a workforce, Tom. Keep them engaged, motivated. That's difficult at a time like this. And we open the show. I think we all know really talented people over at Credit Suisse. This morning, waking up for them, this is a difficult time watching this happen with your company. Can you imagine I... going to work, <clears throat> trying to engage with clients, pitch the message? do business I mean, with Lisa, them, me, with the stock it, doing what it's doing this it's, morning. It's trust and confidence, Lisa. That's all there is to it. It's like the, conf the conflation of liquidity and solvency. And this goes to this broader story of how this is becoming something systemic and really leading to risk aversion broadly, because if you've got a crisis in confidence in such a big bank, it doesn't matter <clears throat> right. kind of what the bigger story is. People start connecting the dots and extrapolating out something that's quite negative. For you of Global Wall Street, with the trading halt on Credit Suisse shares in Zurich, 1.83 Swiss francs, we are informed by Ken Leon, with decades of experience with CFRA and, of course, helping us with American banks. Is it trust and confidence dearth in Zurich, Ken Leon? Is it basically the same as in Palo Alto or California? Is it trust and confidence lack? Is it the same everywhere? Uh, for investors and customers, yes. And uh, it comes in different levels. Uh, this one is concerning <laughs> because it's global. And for the Fed, they're still in their domain of financial stability, uh, which is an issue. Um, and there's lots of new takers into this story, whether it be Congress, policymakers. What does the central bank in Switzerland say about perhaps uh, 
their major franchise that has dwindled over the years. It's a pretty sad story. Trading again now at 1.87, John, a nice lift there, but nowhere above, even on the last 10-minute interval, uh, that would need to get to 1.92 or 1.93, and we're not even there. Yeah, 185 is music to nobody's ears. Yeah. Tom, looking at that stock. Let's continue with Ken Leon as Credit Suisse trades this morning. Uh, Ken Leon, as you mentioned, Credit Suisse, a global name. It's all part of our heritage as well. I'm thunderstruck at where Swiss regulators are. Can American regulators apply any sense of force here on a foreign bank? They, they can as, a, as it relates to their assets in the U.S. or the cooperation that you see at the highest levels of j -PAL working with other central banks around the world, the ECB in particular. <laughs> so, uh, but this one... Spot on. The timeline is short. You don't have to May or June. Jay Powell Monday said to Michael Barr, uh, head of supervision, is that I need a report and it will be shared with the public by May 1st. Congress will have hearings about what's happened in the U.S. with the regional banks. Uh, a lot of this is trust and confidence versus panic. And then when you get into the weeds, that's the important areas. What happened? When did it happen? What went wrong? And I'd like to share more about that because the other major part of the Fed is bank supervision. Ken, there's a story of trust and confidence when it comes to specific issues, whether it's hedging interest rate risk or whether it's just, you know, management missteps on consecutive years in the case of Credit Suisse. Where are the linkages beyond just simply a lack of confidence? The, the weakness is really getting large banks and in this and now smaller banks to invest in technology platforms for compliance and regulation. Michael Corbett of Citigroup for years was told to invest and he didn't. Um, and then there was penalties and hundreds of millions of dollars spent at Citi. Wells Fargo is another example. And you take this at that scale of a global bank, Credit Suisse, um, it's critical to have that. Um, it's taken us five, seven years for all of our uh, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley to do that. But when you get down to mid-sized banks, 100 billion or more, or 10 to 100 billion, they don't have the manpower or the resources to do it like the large banks who've done it well. And on the other side is the Fed has thousands of bank examiners, but after 2018, regulation just stay very focused and tight uh, for those above 250 billion, not 50. And lo and behold, Barney Frank yep. is on the board of directors of Signature Bank. Unreal. Yeah, you know, we're we're going to get theater and Congress on all this, but also the bank <clears throat> examiners and what the banks respond to really matters a lot. Ken, I've got 30 seconds on the clock. There might be some people engaging in this program. Maybe they've never listened or watched this program ever before. They've watched what's happened with banks over the last week and they've taken an interest and they hear us talk about Credit Suisse and they say, Credit who? They've never engaged with this lender before. They don't know what this bank does. They're seeing futures down. Ken, why does this bank matter waking up in the United States this morning? This is a global bank. There might be counterparty risk uh, for some of the U.S. banks. Um, it's also, you know significant in the cog of the capital markets. So if it's not related to direct lending in the U.S., it does matter significantly for the capital markets. And that's where you really have to look and what it impacts in terms of uh, debt instruments, derivatives, as well as equities. Ken, appreciate your perspective. Really do. Thank you, sir. Ken Leon there of CF. RA. Credit Suisse was halted. It was down about 18%. Resumed trading is now down about 16 or 17%. <clears throat> Session low 183. Right now 186. Just off all time lows. Equity futures down more than 1%. And a quick look at European lenders. Socgen's down 9%. BNP Paribas down about 8.6% this morning. Much more still to come. Lizanne Saunders of Charge Swap. This is turning out to be a really, really long week. Let's work through this calmly. 
Equity futures down a little more than 1% on the S&P 500. Similar move on the Nasdaq, much bigger on the Russell, heavily weighted to the financials. We talked about that all through the week so far. And at the end of last week as well, the Russell's down 2%. In the bond market, we keep repricing the Fed, pricing out hikes, pricing in cuts. We're down another 13 basis points on a two-year 411. The data that matters later, retail sales and PPI, apparently. The data that matters right now is this intraday chart right here <coughs> of Credit Suisse, down more than 20%. We broke two, broke 190, just broke 180. 177 on my screen at the moment. Session low, all-time low, 176. It spreads. Take a look at the European banks elsewhere. Got to look at the French lenders, BNP, Socgen. BNP's down about, let's call it 10% now, Tom. Socgen down 9.8%. Pretty ugly out there. We've got such a guest that we have to get to Liz Ann Saunders, but John, I'll just say this is the first moment I can compare and contrast to March of 2008. This is not like Lehman. This is like Bear Stearns in that the Swiss government has to figure out what to do. There's no, there's truly no alternative. So if you are just tuning in this morning and you're looking <clears throat> at Credit Suisse down 21% at 175, good morning to you, first of all. And secondly, let's work through the news we've had so far this morning. We heard from the chairman. He was speaking at a conference. He said state assistance is not a topic. And then we heard this from the Saudi National Bank, which is the top shareholder of Credit Suisse at the moment, just under 10 percent of the overall name. Ruling out more assistance to the bank does not want to go over that 10 percent threshold, which would include extra regulatory scrutiny. Lisa, but he said it was more than that. And I find these comments almost bizarre this morning, knowing how delicate this moment is for this name, for this bank that you hold. To say those things, even if you think them, to say them out loud, you must be aware they're going to carry some weight. So was he trying to tank the stocks? I mean, that's I don't know what question. he was thinking. Right, but what was he thinking? To your point, though, just to build on this fragility of the moment, Credit Suisse has been uh, under scrutiny for such a long time and has seen a flight of investors for a while. So, yes, there is so much sensitivity, but there's this broader sensitivity, too, of this financial risk that suddenly has come to the fore that is completely shaking markets, and that's also leading some pretty outsized moves. We keep going back to the data, don't we? Talking about retail sales later. Nobody cares anymore. His CPI came in a little bit hotter on core. <laughs> Labor market. Payrolls headline. Yeah. Fantastic. Great. All of that stuff lined up. And everyone thought well, that would open the door to 50 after what Chairman Powell said a week ago, just a week ago. Right now, we're barely pricing in another rate hike. We have downgraded to a terminal rate of 4.8% from 5% earlier this morning. Things are moving fast in the wake of some The market, Tom, is saying the Fed is done. Yeah, let's get to Lizanne, but I would suggest strongly that this is an evolution across three or four days and the measurement that Bloomberg reporting this morning on the billions going to Bank of America. Why will that end today? And the answer is it will not. There's no question about that. Let's get to Lizanne Saunders with just wonderful experience in this moment, chief investment strategist at Charles Schwab. And I want to make clear, not with executive capabilities there, we will not talk to her about the challenges of Thank the you. major donor to the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. <laughs> <laughs> Lizanne, good morning. And on the strategy of the moment, we have been here. What is different this time? We, we, we have been here, but I think when you look back to 2008 and you look at what was the massive leverage throughout the entire financial system, the trillions and trillions of dollars of exposure to the alphabet soup of derivatives tied to the mortgage market, um, this is a different situation. Now, when you have a, a, a Credit Suisse like today, and I, I, I agree with you, I, I was watching um, when the comments came out of Saudi Arabia that we're not doing anything, and that was terribly surprising. One thing about Credit Suisse, though, and I don't cover the stock, obviously, but um, this stock has been in a huge uh, downfall for two years. So there are clearly problems within this particular institution that predated what happened with SVB. But as a prior guest said, what we don't know yet is the <clears throat> counterparty risk. And I think that's mm -hmm. clearly what's hitting the market. I, I tell you who I do not want to be uh, in the next week is, is Jerome Powell. Boy, he is, uh, yeah. you know, the Fed is in a very uh, massive pickle here right now. You have been courageous in crisis, Lizanne, to find opportunities. Just to do a compare and contrast, folks, this is off the BQ screen on the Bloomberg Terminal in Swiss francs. The Credit Suisse book value in crisis is appalling. It is 0 0.16, I believe, is the statistic. And their compatriot, UBS, is a far larger number, one point, I believe, it's 0.2 uh, as well. 
the disparities here create opportunity. Is there opportunity, Lizanne, in the major, major solvent, solid banks? I think there is, but I would expand that beyond just the financial space. I think this is an environment where, and it's not just about size being a benefit. I, I think within the, the world of traditional banking, um, I, I think there's that stability that it comes with some of the larger institutions. But I think it's really spread across sectors and industries right now. We've talked about this. You've got the return of the risk-free rate. That means price discovery. Um, not only do you want to try to find companies that are self-funding, that they've got uh, strong cash flows and earnings, their short duration equities where they don't have to access the credit markets, the capital markets, they can fund their operation. That tends to mean larger companies. But again, I'd apply it outside of just the financials. And, uh, you know, as you know, we've been factor based. And one of the factors we've been focusing on are these sort of self-funding companies, shorter duration companies. Um, and I think that fits certainly within the technology space and the financial space. But I think you apply that kind of screening across the spectrum of uh, sectors and industries. I yeah. think that's a big shift that came with the return of the risk-free rate. Lizanne, this morning when I walked in, I was hoping that we could move on from some of the concerns around financial market stability. It seemed to make sense that there were stories that were highly idiosyncratic, specific issues at specific banks. Credit Suisse, as you said, is also a specific a bank with specific issues that have been ongoing for years, perhaps unrelated to the, uh, the tightening right. that we've seen in monetary conditions. And yet here we are. This is affecting everything with respect to risk sentiment. And you're right, Jerome Powell is now basically priced out of rate hikes. Yet again, even on the heels of hotter than expected CPI data on the margins. From your perspective, is the sentiment telling us something, something important about where we're headed and the fact that the rate hiking cycle is over? Um, I, if it's not over, it's probably very close uh, to being over. Uh, our bias at this point, especially with what's happening with Credit Suisse, is that the Fed will opt not to do um, anything, even in spite of, um, you know, the tick up in, in core CPI. Um, I think they'll be careful not to suggest that that's it, they're done, because if you start to see some stability in the financial system, I will say that what's really frustrating to me, you guys have done a, a phenomenal job of reporting on all of this, but spend any time on Twitter and the misinformation that is out there, the conflating of what's gone on, the, the blending of FDIC and SIPC as if they're the same thing. What is the meaning of the Fed's new facility as a liquidity and funding facility? And I've seen it all jumbled together into kind of one animal. And there's a lot of people that get their information in, in, in a form like that. And that's been really, really tough. Well, I think the 08 situation, there was a, just a lack of misunderstanding because it was so complicated. Here, there's sort of not simple concepts, but, you know, try to conflating FDIC and SIPC, which we've seen done, just looking at that is uh, is quite frustrating. Right now, we're seeing the European stocks uh, bank index down about 6%. I want to pick up on this, Lizanne, a Twitter-fueled bank run. That is what a number of people have called what we saw over in the U.S. Is that what you yep. see right now with Credit Suisse that could cause the or accelerate the demise of a bank that otherwise might have a three-year plan? You know, I don't want to say yes or no. I, I don't cover the the stock. I think it's premature to speculate whether we'll ultimately uh, call this a bank run. But I think what's important and what we're seeing is not just about the power of social media and how information flow is so much quicker right now, but just how speedy changes can be made. That, you know, when all the, the media reports and photos of what was happening at SVB showed lines, those weren't lines of depositors waiting to go in the bank to get their money out. It was mostly just gawkers. You know, we, we, <sighs> we change money, we move money digitally um, in an instant. And I think it's the in the instant that makes this situation different than prior historical, you know, bank runs and the like. Lizanne, we appreciate your cool, calm and collected thoughts, as always. Lizanne Saunders there John. of Charles Schwab. <clears throat> Let's return back to the stock. Stock's down more than 20%. 177. That's just off an all-time low. 
the words which sort of reverberate around Switzerland come from the Saudi National Bank chairman this morning speaking to Bloomberg, saying, <clears throat> will you invest more? Will you offer more assistance? The answer is absolutely not, for many reasons outside the simplest reason, which is regulatory and statutory. We haven't heard from Credit Suisse this morning. We have heard from their friends across the road over at UBS. Ralph Hammers, the CEO over there, saying just moments ago, Tom, they're focused on their own strategy, won't answer hypothetical questions on Credit Suisse. But I think we're all watching the same name because it's right. spilling over. You look at the European names this morning, Sockgen's down 9%, BNP Paribas down about 8 9% right. itself. Particularly for those of you in London and, and on London Wall Street amid this bank crisis, what's important here is the timing at the Morgan Stanley Conference. Mr. Hammers, I'm going to guess 550, 555 are those comments out on Bloomberg at 603 to our world class speed there on headlines. John, it doesn't, you know, it's not the hyperbole that it seems ages ago, but I think right now, after the last 38 minutes, he's going to have no comment at 641 here a minute from now. So, Thomas, you know, been around for a long time. People have visceral reactions to comparing things to like 2008, mm -hmm. 99, 2000. I don't like to go there. But one thing that frustrates me about people who do is that when we benchmark to those extremes, I think it's easy to say it's not that and then become dismissive about the moment we're in. So let's not benchmark to the extreme, benchmark to what's happened in another period and just talk about the moment we're in. Just because it's not that does not mean this is good. And what we've seen over the last week, Lisa, is not good. And it's going to tighten financial conditions meaningfully, and that's what we've heard from people, because there is suddenly a reluctance uh, to uh, really just lend to anyone and an increased concern about counterparty risk, and that's really the unknown here. <clears throat> what are the potential counterparty risks within the banking system? I mean, why else? All things being equal, the big U.S. banks should benefit from this because they can capitalize on the business, but they're not. Their shares are much lower, and this is speaking to this concern about the broader systemic risk. Yeah, Credit Suisse, Tom, is a different beast. It's a different beast. I am in the camp that it is a global bank with massive Asian perspective that no one's talking about. This is not another Silicon Valley. It's different and it's global. 176, stocks down 21%. Equity futures down by, let's call it 1.5% lower. We'll catch up with Simon French from Panmore Gordon very shortly. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. UK Chancellor Jeremy Hunt will pledge to drive economic growth by unblocking business investment in his first budget today. The most pressing issue for him, high inflation, weak growth, a cost of living crisis and labor shortages. But with the UK tax burden at a post-war high, he will struggle to raise taxes or find savings. Bloomberg understands a multi-billion pound expansion of free childcare is also under consideration. Bloomberg has learned U.S. prosecutors were investigating signature bank's dealings with crypto clients before its sudden seizure by regulators. We're told officials were examining whether the New York bank took sufficient steps to detect potential money laundering. The SEC is also said to have been scrutinizing the lender. Meanwhile, the Fed is said to be considering changes to its oversight of mid-sized banks following the collapse of three lenders over the past week. Regulators at the U.S. Central Bank are weighing bringing capital and liquidity thresholds closer to those that apply to the big Wall Street firms. The changes would affect banks with assets between $100 and $250 billion. And inflation in Argentina accelerated sharply in February due to soaring food prices. Its CPI spiked over 6% for the month and registered a 102% increase annually. Argentina last saw a triple-digit inflation rate back in the early 1990s. Its sky-high consumer prices and severe crop drought are expected to tip its economy into recession. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. I'm wondering whether you would be open to assisting further if there was another call for additional liquidity from Credit Suisse. The answer is absolutely not, for many reasons, outside the simplest reason, which is regulatory and statutory. We now own 9.8% um, of the bank. If we go above 10%, all kinds of new rules kick in. 
whether it be by our regulator or the European regulator or the Swiss regulator, and we're not inclined to get into a new regulatory regime. Words hurt. They hurt Credit Suisse's stock in a big way. That was the Saudi National Bank chairman speaking with the brilliant Bloomberg's Youssef Gamal Al-Din. Credit Suisse right now is down by more than 20%, 179 on the stock, 179, just off session lows of 172, all-time lows on Credit Suisse. And if we unpack that statement from the Saudi <laughs> National Bank chairman, Tom, part of it is obvious. Yes, there are some regulatory things that kick in once you go above 10%. Doubt with that, that's one. Let's get to two, Lisa. Two is he said there were other reasons, and three, he said it all out loud. Which is the real issue, and you've been bringing this up all morning, rightly so. Why would he do this? This is his own investment in a company that everyone would understand if he says he doesn't want to invest for many reasons, not just regulatory. That wouldn't be great for the share price. So oh. at what point is this a misspeak, or at what point is this a very dramatic reaction also at a moment let's, that's highly fraught? Let's pause for Youssef Gamal Aldin, who... Uh, uh, just plain and simple crowbarred it out of them. I thought it was a great interview and very terse, and this is what reporting's about. John, I would note also that finally the buyers have shown up on Credit Suisse ever so slightly a lift from a uh, 172 a to a 172. We'll take what we can well, get Well, Tom, right you've got now. to remember there's people waking up right now, <clears throat> and welcome to the program, who haven't seen the stock yet, and they're thinking, yeah. you think 178's good? They're like, yeah. well, <laughs> we were I north just... of two a little bit earlier on this week. Let's go through it piece by piece. Yeah. The Saudi National National Bank currently owns about 9.88% of this company. Now, they don't want to own 10, I get it, but ultimately, by the end of today, at least give it 10 minutes. <laughs> they you know, will. They, they will. You go out to the price action elsewhere. Let's start with equity stateside. Equity futures down by 1.6% on the S&P 500. If you look at how this is spilling across through the bond market, we're just pricing out the Fed even more. We're down 20 basis points now on a two-year, 4.04%. I can bring out the German curve as well, just quickly on the Bloomberg. We're down about 32 basis points. So the two-year in Germany is 257 at a time where some people still think maybe the ECB goes 50 basis points tomorrow. <laughs> 50, really? <clears throat> I'm looking at European banks at the moment. They're all down. Every single Eurozone bank on the SX7E, the Euro Stocks Bank Index. Sock Gen's down almost 10%. Yeah. Lisa BNP's down 9.7%. This, to me, is raising this real conundrum for central bankers because clearly shareholders believe that there is some financial issue that goes deeper than one bank and what idiosyncratic issue. And suddenly they're piecing together into broad oh. risk aversion. And at what point does this counteract the inflation that we continue to see in all the data? And at what point is this contagion? I, I think that it also it is cultural. And there's somebody in the zeitgeist, I ha can't remember who John talked about are we really seeing Swiss separation from the European continent and finance right now? What is the Swiss neutrality? How unique is Swiss National Bank? Or is it everybody in the same pool at the same time? Some of these moves, Tom, really tough. <clears throat> really, really tough. They are. Let us go to this and get some perspective here. And yes, it's on economics, but we can fold it into the financial economics. It's in Chapter 23 of BEG. That's the British textbook. Nobody ever gets to Chapter 23 except Simon French, chief economist at Panmer Gordon. Simon, link the financial stresses right now to your economic world and particularly the combination of those two for Christine Lagarde. Yeah, uh, there's a fight, tightening of financial conditions that is going on in front of our very eyes uh, this morning. And what shareholders are trying to calculate is how that passes through to a real economy that is about to, based on all the forward guidance information from the ECB, bar the odd little outlier this morning, is going to move 50 basis points. So a already a tightening of financial conditions being baked in. <clears throat> all ahead of any contagion risk. And I hopefully was pretty honest in my note yesterday when I said we simply don't know the degree to which this is systemic or isolated, whether this was poor balance sheet management on the part of three tech-focused, principally US banks, or whether this is a bit like we saw in the UK back in the autumn last year, something of a canary in the mine here, which illustrates <coughs> 
potential portfolio losses unrealized at the moment that will require capital raising down the line, which is why I think that Credit Suisse uh, interview that you've been talking about over the last few minutes, indeed all morning, is absolutely relevant to what is focusing the minds of financials investors at the I moment. It's absolutely bizarre. I'd go one further than that. Simon, in the United States of the Federal Reserve, this chairman, people often say, is worried about being Burns and wants to be Volcker. Is President Lagarde worried about being Trichet? It's the sell-side analogy of choice at the moment, and I think for good reason, because, yes, because core inflation took longer to alight in the Eurozone, they are uh, slower at reaching the peak. Indeed, it hasn't really peaked in the Eurozone, and therefore the policy prescription in terms of higher interest rates has come later. But it looks like very late in the financial cycle, given the events of recent days. And I think the degree to which the ECB made the strategic decision to almost pre-commit to certainly 50 in March and arguably 50 at subsequent meetings in Q2 is now looking like quite a misstep. At a time when they were wanting to move towards data dependency, they laid out forward guidance, which looks quite inflexible. So, yes, I think that is a reasonable parallel to draw this morning. Simon, let's build on that. This policy error that you highlight of indicating they are going to go 50 basis points tomorrow at a time when people are basically almost pricing them out. When you take a look at the two-year yield in Germany, what do you think is the consequence if they do follow through on their pledge and go 50 basis points? And what's the consequence if they don't? Well, the consequence, if they do, is not so much the immediate uh, pass-through on financial conditions, but it, what it is where the communications around that move tells us about whether actually they've stumbled across terminal rates in uh, in the eurozone, having assumed they're about 100 up until the start of last week, more than 100 to 150 basis points higher. Um, but the real question you what one has to ask is why given the information we have now at our disposable and the premium that is now on another few days indeed another few weeks of of data that premium is so high that is so valuable in terms of understanding the context the significance the systemic nature of this the, is it beyond the realms of possibility to do a, a, a reverse? I think it's easier for the Fed. I think it's easier for the Bank of England next week. I think it's much harder for the, uh, the ECB, given where they've boxed themselves in. Simon, we've got to leave it there. Appreciate your perspective. Simon French there of Panmore Gordon. Nobody wants to be Chairman Powell next week. You certainly don't want to be President Lagarde going into tomorrow's meeting. Credit Suisse right now <clears throat> is down 21% at 176. Session low is 172 all-time low is 172. If you are just waking up, I know many of you are stateside. Good morning to you. A little bit of news earlier this morning. The Saudi National Bank, biggest shareholder of Credit Suisse, top shareholder, the chairman spoke to Youssef Gamal Adin here at Bloomberg, was asked whether they'd provide more assistance to Credit Suisse. The answer, absolutely not, for many reasons outside the simplest reason, which is regulatory and statutory, of course, doesn't want to go over this 10% threshold. But mentioning that it was so much more than that and also just saying all of this stuff out loud. We heard from the Credit Suisse chairman a little bit earlier this morning. He was talking at a conference, Tom, and basically said state assistance is not a topic. Of course, they're not going to you say it out loud, UBS even if it was. The UBS executive. We've heard from the UBS executive yeah. separately, Tom, mm. as well, who said they don't Excuse want to talk me. about what's going on. This is Ralph Hammers <clears throat> said, won't answer hypothetical right. questions on Credit Suisse. I think it's important to point out this morning that it's not just Credit Suisse this morning. Futures are down, Tom, by 1.7% on the S&P. In the last 10 minutes here, waking up in America, follow on here. I'm going to say four big figures on the VIX, not out to 30, but out to 28 gets my attention. John, 71 on SPX. Dow was a 600 print at one point. NASDAQ, 1.6%. And we're going to get a retest right now in that dearth of buying in Credit Suisse. The little bit of breath we got here is beginning to fade away in the last three or four minutes. And this move in the bond market, we might drop back below four. Maybe three ninety nine on a two year. We're very close, about a basis point away. Wow, look four point zero one percent on a two year lease. Wow. We're down twenty four basis points. Not just stateside, but also 
big moves at the front end of the German curve as well. People are saying basically the tightening that you're seeing in financial markets right now will do the job for central bankers. I'm looking at the European Banks Index, uh, that stocks index, and it is down the most for more than a year. It's down 7%. This isn't just Credit Suisse. This is all of the banks in Europe. It's pretty tough, isn't it? Equity futures right now on the S&P down by 1.75%, trying to stage some kind of bounce, I guess, in the last couple of minutes. In about 34 minutes' time, we'll catch up with Nouriel Rabini. Looking forward to that conversation. Futures are down, yields are lower, Credit Suisse in focus. This is Bloomberg. The Federal Reserve is moving to slow inflation. That is going to have collateral damage along the way. The Fed is going to be between a rock and a hard place. Inflation is going to be high and they're going to find it very hard, I think, even to pause, let alone cut. We're down to now we're kind of debating we're pricing zero versus 25. And I think that's very, very rational at this point. The Fed will need to maintain credibility, will need to save face, but at the same time, dial back their hawkishness. If the markets are in serious distress, pausing is OK. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. What a difference a week makes. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Equity futures on the S&P <coughs> down by 1.8%. One stock in focus, Credit Suisse, is down 23%. A secession low, it's an all-time low, 170. We're in the 170s on Credit Suisse. The words of the Saudi National Bank chairman, top shareholder to Bloomberg earlier this morning. Will you invest more? Will you provide assistance, Tom? The answer, absolutely not. For many reasons, outside the simplest reason, which is regulatory and statutory. We'll show that here in a number of minutes. I thought it was telling, John, in our opening montage there, we had not one but two people that survived the Lehman Wars. Neuberger Berman and Ethan Harris, of course, was chief economist at Lehman. Uh, at, at the time, is this like Lehman? No. To me, it's like Bear Stearns. We're like March of 2008. It's just as simple as this. When does the Swiss government step in and say this has gone too far? The Credit Suisse chairman spoke earlier this morning and said state <clears throat> assistance is not a topic they're going to talk about, Tom. Of course, they're not going to talk about that publicly oh, of course. anyway. Yes, of course. But it's a difficult time and a difficult time for many people we know who work at that institution. I'm sure many of you at home know some fantastic people there, too, who are going to be very <clears throat> distracted trying to work today, looking at some of these moves outside of Credit Suisse. You're seeing the risk emerge elsewhere. Futures are lower. There's a massive bid no. again into the front end of the yield curve in the U.S. The two-year yield is down by 18 basis points in America at 4.06 percent. There are no easy decisions here, Lisa, for central bank policymakers. Lagarde tomorrow, pound next week. Lagarde had basically <coughs> pre-committed to 50 basis points. What on earth do they do now? This was supposed to be the retail sales show. This was supposed to be get back to normal. Look at the inflation. Look at the growth. Right now, it is anything but. You say, what a difference a week makes, what a difference a couple hours makes, or even just minutes when you talk about the potential for more contagion risk or the fear of it within the banking system. And what you see right now is central bankers that are stuck between yeah. committing to fighting inflation, like they've said, and raising rates and saying, you know what, we're <clears throat> not here to protect right. the financial system, or potentially supporting them by not raising rates. And then the moral hazard of that. Do mm -hmm. you just come in to rescue financial institutions? And what do you care about the average American who's still dealing with right. inflation? I mean, this is a rock and a hard place. I want to make clear here, and this is just, I, I should have mentioned this earlier, John. To all of you, particularly in America, other networks are quoting Credit Suisse in U.S. dollars. We do not do that. We stay quoting in Swiss francs. So you're looking at a 174, John, off a bounce of a 171 rounded up. But we're quoting in Swiss francs this morning. Without a doubt, looking at 174, at least on Credit Suisse stock, <clears throat> and I'll go back to some of the European lenders elsewhere. We've seen Sockgen, BNP Paribas get wrapped up in all of this. Sockgen's down a little more than 10%. Looking at BNP wow. Paribas, down about 10% as well. Commerce Bank, another name, at least, down about 9% this morning too. Yeah, Torsten Slack of Apollo uh, just came out with this. When the facts change, my view changes. A financial accident has happened, and we are going from no landing to a hard landing, driven by tighter credit conditions. People are looking at a new landscape driven by some of this financial <coughs> concern that we're seeing in the bank. I said industry. what a difference a week makes, hey? We were talking a week ago, Chairman Powell had just had day one of his semi-annual testimony, opening the door seemingly to going 50. We were all sitting around the table, OK, how low is that bar? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Payrolls Friday, 3.11. Yesterday, Literally. CPI core hot. Going to get retail sales, no one cares. 
No one's even talking about retail sales this morning. No one cares about any of the economic data because right now that's all backward looking and the landscape <clears throat> has changed. As Torsten yeah. Slock said, the rapid tightening in financial conditions have really caused a backdrop that causes a, a potential hard landing right. that people are starting to price this in. This crisis and the, 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 the global sense of it all of a sudden with Credit Suisse, and it's, yes, it's a bond move and we're very fixed income here. John, OECD just out, I believe, with their gross domestic product table. Thank you, Barbara Sklodowski, for this in London. And they're really looking at an economic, not malaise, but slowdown. And we've seen that quietly in oil. So do we have a financial crisis linked into an oil slowdown? American West Texas Intermediate, the NYMEX, just printing below 70. That is, I'm sorry, it's off the radar, John, but we've got to look at the sum of these different statistics. Oh, it gets your attention. So yeah. yesterday's session crude was down 4.6%, <clears throat> down 25 on Monday. There is a supply side story here in the crude story this morning. The IEA yes. put out a note yeah. a little bit earlier this morning and reported that the crude market was actually back at a surplus off the back of what's happening with Russia, Lisa, right. which is surprising because we came into this week and, I mean, seriously, rip up the playbook for 2023, but came into this year thinking China rebound, crude's going to do OK, Goldman looking at triple digits, and here we are south of 70 on WTR briefly. I would argue you said right you're a year ahead outlook on March 31st. Maybe you can write another one on April 30th because right now things are moving so quickly, whether it's Russia public printing, uh, 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 pumping as much oil as they possibly can or potential distress of something breaking. Well, it's March 15th, <laughs> so a few more weeks to go. 168, <laughs> Credit Suisse halted again, down 25%, down 25% in Swiss trading. Got a great guest lined up, David <clears throat> Kelly, Chief Global Strategist at JP Morgan Asset Management. David, wonderful to hear from you and great to see you. What a difference a week makes. What do you make of what's unfolding this morning? Well, it's, it's unfortunately a pre predictable uh, further wave after what we saw with uh, SVB and Signature Bank over the weekend. Uh, the, these kinds of crises do work in waves because it's really about a confidence crisis. And what's really happening here, you know, the Federal Reserve since 2008 has been conducting stress tests. Well, really what's happening here is the market is conducting a stress test on the Fed. Uh, and, it, you know, how far can the Federal Reserve raise short-term interest rates, uh, given how low they were for so long, without causing some damage? And we've discovered uh, that, that we've now reached the limit of what the Federal Reserve can do without causing significant problems. So they, they should stop. Uh, and... Uh, you know, I, th I think you know, I've heard other other guests talk about how the Fed is between a rock and a hard place. I don't believe that. I think they're between a rock and a soft place because I think inflation is coming down. It will come down. Um, this is not a fundamentally inflationary economy. So the Federal Reserve and other central banks, uh, I think at this stage, should stop hiking and provide real reassurance that they are going to the, uh, protect the financial system and deal with this uh, this problem. I think that's really what they need to focus on. David, the fear that's out there is personified in flows. I'm not going to ask you how many gazillions JP Morgan took in yesterday. I know you know the number, but you can't talk about it. It's a joke, folks, in crisis. But the answer, uh, Dr. Kelly, is flows and fear matter. Where will the flows lead to? Do we lead to a place where portfolios recover? Or do we lead to instability into the summer of this year? Well, portfolios will eventually recover. And I, I, think, the, I think the key here is it's, it's all about the inflation, actually. Because, you know, people keep on talking about hot inflation. But the truth is inflation has now fallen on a year-over-year -year basis for eight consecutive months. And what I think is much more important is wages are growing slower than headline inflation for 23 consecutive months. That tells me workers don't have bargaining power. Despite how tight this labor market is, workers don't have bargaining power to get fully compensated for inflation. If that's right, then inflation will gradually come down, whether we have a recession or not, no matter what the central banks do, inflation will gradually ease over the next year or two. And central banks need to just um, you know, allow that to happen. And if they do, you end up back in the middle of this decade, actually where you were in the middle of the last decade with a low inflation, slow growing economy, but a low inflation economy, which I think will support uh, both stocks and bonds. So I think we will get there, but it's going to be a pretty bumpy ride getting there. 
David, just in the moment that we're in, where people are very worried about financial market contagion, and you could say that this is a Twitter-fueled run or a Twitter-fueled kind of uh, hysteria with people getting growingly concerned and spreading around information, how deep does it go, though, in terms of a crisis in confidence and what that means with respect to lending conditions, what that means for defaults, what that means for just how quickly this economy could come to a halt? Well, I think I think there's a lot of protection for the for the real economy, particularly here in the United States. First of all, we still have this huge excess demand for labor, uh, which has been keeping payroll growth strong, even though demand is weakening. And second of all, there's no real overbuild in any fundamental uh, sector of the economy. We don't have too many houses or too much investment spending or too many inventories. So there's nothing I think that's going to drive this economy into a deep recession. I think lending conditions will tighten, though. Um, and we've already seen some of that. I think we're going to see more of that. Uh, and, you know, I think lending conditions will tighten. I don't expect default rates or, or problems with loans to increase rapidly unless you have a significant downturn in the economy itself. But I think it's just a very important for authorities to remind people that we're not going to let it all fall apart. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think that's why this, the Federal Reserve should really, you know, stop tightening here. And just focus on that reassurance. Uh, you know, when the Federal Reserve and other central banks are actually really good if they if they put their minds to it in controlling a crisis. If they'll focus on that, and they can focus on that because inflation is going to fade, and they, they just got to have enough confidence that inflation is going to fade. Focus on reassuring people. You know, we've got a, a we've seen a huge buildup in in capital in the U.S. banking system since two thousand and eight. Uh, we do have very well capitalized banks overall, uh, and I think the Federal Reserve just needs to provide some reassurance on that, uh, on that fact and, and on the stability of the system. Keep saying it, a week. It feels like a long, long time in this market. David Kelly there of JP Morgan Asset Management. David, thanks for that. Credit Suisse down 20%. Session low, all-time low, 168. We're just off that at 178 this morning. The stock's been hammered. Heard from Larry Fink of BlackRock, put out a letter today. Said, quote, the dominoes starting to fall. It's too early to know how widespread the damage is. We don't know yet whether the consequences of easy money and regulatory changes will cascade throughout the U.S. regional banking sector with more seizures and shutdowns. It ultimately lasted about a decade and more than a thousand thrifts went under. Reflecting on what's been happening over the last few decades in the banking system. It's a great, great letter if you have the chance to read through some of the quotes. Lisa, this is a tough time. I think Dan Iverson and Pimco said it was a multi-month process we need to work through now. A multi-month process and you've got central bankers who need to confront where we are imminently. President Lagarde tomorrow, Chairman Powell next week. And what the dominoes are to fall. I mean, one thing that Larry Fink was talking about is perhaps the second uh, sort of domino to fall would be in these medium-sized banks. And then the third, he points to funds invested in illiquid investments, this sort of private equity, real estate, and private credit question that people have been raising for a long time. What do central banks do? If you are just tuning in this morning, good morning to you all on TV and on Bloomberg Radio. Credit Suisse down 20%. The chairman of the Saudi National Bank speaking to Youssef Gamal al-Din of Bloomberg this morning, asked if he'd provide more assistance. The answer, absolutely not, for many reasons outside the simplest reason, which is regulatory and statutory, and that really putting the knife into a stock that was already struggling. The stock right now, 179. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Syrian President Bashar al-Assad is meeting with Russian counterpart Vladimir Putin in Moscow today as the Kremlin pushes for a Syria-Turkey reconciliation. Russia will also host four-way talks involving Turkey, Syria and Iran. The potential deal opposed by the U.S. comes after China brokered a diplomatic detente between Iran and Saudi Arabia, demonstrating its newfound weight in the region. Credit Suisse's chief executive officer says the bank had seen inflows of client funds on Monday after markets in U.S. banks were pummeled by the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank. Pretty calm. Mm -hmm. um, we even saw material good inflows yesterday still. Um, also, you know, I had a client meeting which was very positive on that one. So, so far it's calm, but I think it's early days to, to look at that. Meanwhile, Credit Suisse's top shareholder ruled out providing more financial assistance to the struggling Swiss bank. The answer is absolutely not, for many reasons, outside the simplest reason, which is regulatory and statutory. We now own 9.8% um, of the bank. If we go above 10%, all kinds of new rules kick in, whether it be by our regulator or the European regulator or the Swiss regulator, and we're not inclined to get into a new regulatory regime. 
The Saudi National Bank chairman spoke to Bloomberg on the sidelines of the financial sector conference in Riyadh. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lise Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. I'm wondering whether you would be open to assisting further if there was another call for additional liquidity from Credit Suisse. The answer is absolutely not, for many reasons, outside the simplest reason, which is regulatory and statutory. We now own 9.8% um, of the bank. If we go above 10%, all kinds of new rules kick in, whether it be by our regulator or the European regulator or the Swiss regulator and we're not inclined to get into a new regulatory regime. Stunning, the Saudi National Bank chairman speaking with Bloomberg's Youssef Gamal Aldin. Not stunning because they place regulatory issues if they go above 10%. We know that. Stunning because he said it out loud and said there were other reasons too. I'm sure that the C-suite at Credit Suisse were not too happy about hearing that early this morning. The stock's on an eight-day losing streak, 181 on Credit Suisse. We're down by almost 20%. A little bit early, we were down 25 The low of the session, that's a record low now, 168. But if you're just waking up, ultimately 180. It's brutal. It's a one-handle on Credit Suisse this morning, and it bleeds to the rest of the market. Equity futures down about 1.6% on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq, we're down one4 The Russell, the banks, we're going to be looking at the U.S. banks. Heavily weighted to the financials on a Russell. We're down about 2.6% there. In the bond market, we're pricing out hikes. We're pricing in cuts. Down 17 basis points on a two-year in America. We came really close to going back into the threes on a two-year earlier. We're doing the same thing over in Germany. Pricing out hikes, pricing in cuts. Got the ECB tomorrow. European Central Bank's got to confront this tomorrow after basically pre-committing to 50. Who knows what they're going to do with Sockgen Tom down 10%. Hey. BNP down 9.6%. Commerce Bank, take your pick this morning <clears throat> over in Europe. We're down 8% there too. Take your pick and they have a knowledge base of what the next bank is. It's not to be inflammatory and say there's another Credit Suisse, but now Credit Suisse trading here with some kind of activity bouncing off 1.68. This is the first time, John, I have two 10-minute intervals, they're called, where Credit Suisse lifts off that horrific 168 level 1.80 Swiss francs. Tomorrow is the one year anniversary of the first interest rate hike <clears> of this cycle. Tom, tomorrow. And a year in, more than 400 basis points of hikes, playing catch up because this Fed was late. And this market's screaming, you're done. It's screaming you're done a week after Chairman Powell seemingly teed up, opened the door at least, yeah. to go in even faster. There are indicators of this. I go short term. I go to the land of Ira Jersey and I look at a, uh, the dynamic of three month paper, three month T bills. They've improved the last couple of days. They're not as inflammatory as they were Monday or even Friday, but we're nowhere near, anywhere near yet saying the rate regime is pulling back from the agony that caused the California mess. Look how quickly things have changed in a few days. <clears throat> Torsten's well, like Apollo. Clear. Well, Lisa mentioned clear. Torsten early this morning. We've been talking about Torsten for weeks, talking up no landing. Data confirmed it, at least in the early part of this year. Where's the recession? Payrolls, 311, unemployment. A month ago, it was 3.4%. Then we had CPI, still looked hot. Retail sales again. <clears throat> no one's going to talk about retail sales at 8.30 after what we're seeing. Lisa, he's gone from no landing to hard landing, just like that. When the facts change, my view changes. That is Torsten Slock saying a financial accident has happened. And a lot of people were wondering, what is the terminal rate since nothing has broken for so long, that it seemed like this market was so resilient, this economy was so resilient. So if nothing's breaking, maybe that terminal rate for the Fed was much higher. People talking six, six and a half percent. And suddenly, here we are. And perhaps the market's saying, we've hit it. <clears throat> financial accident has happened. Something broke. And that means we're done. Maybe there's news pending. We will have to see. And we need to step carefully here because we have with us now someone hugely qualified in Frankfurt to speak of these dynamics and these mysteries. Jan Patrick Barnett is with Bloomberg and brings to his reporting tangible banking experience. Jan Patrick, what is the mood, the sweat, the, the fear that would be at the Credit Suisse headquarters, the thousands of Zurich people working for Credit Suisse. What is their angst this morning? 
Well, that's uh, that's hard to say, but the, the interesting thing, the thing to me is like whenever I say something critical about Grid Swiss in the last couple of days on on TV, on radio, or in, or in print, then people reached out from from inside Grid Swiss to me, like uh, fiercely fighting for their employer and then telling me all kinds about like what they're trying to do to make uh, things going better. So that shows me they are still like passionate people at Credit Swiss. Um, the management so far not so passionate. Um, uh, and if you have your stock like tumbling that much, uh, I mean, like I, I guess I would be concerned. Uh, working for for the bank because you simply don't know what's what's going to have ne happen next. Um, especially as this is not an isolated issue anymore. Um, we are now moving into a more broader banking recession problem, and that's like that's why Credit Suisse is down 20% and the others are only down eight or 10% um, because the bank now has to fight like another fire uh, on its balance sheet, I would say. Uh, and, and on its earnings, and, and that makes the turnaround where we yesterday heard give us three years. I would say this three years has now gone to six years, maybe. Jan Patrick, how shocked are you to hear the words from the Saudi National Bank chairman this morning to Bloomberg? How shocked were you by uh, that, I, that language? Uh, absolutely not. I mean, the language was hard when he says absolutely not going into this. But I mean, think about it. They took part in the in the capital race three months ago. The stock's down 50% since then. I mean, like, if you are a responsible asset manager everywhere on the world, you're not going like, yeah, sure, let's ship in another billion um, down the road here. That's not going to happen. So it makes total sense for me that he says, like, at this point, no, thank you. Uh, we have put enough money into this bank. Now they need to show to make it work. And again, given all the other stuff happening around the bank, why should you take this risk? It's, it's a horrible risk reward profile at this point. Yeah, and Patrick, right now I'm looking at the credit default swaps on Credit Suisse, which have blown out. That means the price that people are demanding to insure against some sort of default in Credit Suisse has gone through the roof to the highest levels that we've seen going back uh, in history. Uh, what is the potential consequence of this for the European banking system? Are people starting, starting to game that out of how this will look? Well, it's it's a massive issue, and especially for Credit Suisse, I would say, because like now you are getting attacked from all sides. You're getting attacked from uh, probably the the central banks when they stop hiking rates, so all the rates benefits are uh, going to fade out. Then you're getting attacked from the from the econ econ economic side uh, with like your your loan loss provisions most likely are going up. Then you're getting attacked from your refunding side, uh, especially as Credit Suisse, where you have to pay higher rates to to refund your business. So this overall is is not great time for for banking stocks, and that's why we are seeing them uh, being sold right now. The last three to four months, everybody was taking a very comfortable position in the overall equity market, but especially in European banks, thinking like, we get a uh, grinding down of inflation, everything is safe, uh, we get a soft landing, the economy is still doing fine, earnings are doing fine. And this whole scenario is now gone. And that's why the market reaction is so hard, in my view, because now you have to massively reprice what the economy will look like um, 12 months down the road. And that's why you see banking stocks, no bids there, because that's the first line of defense. Why would you own this stock moving into such a scenario? I, I don't see it. Yeah, and Patrick, do we have any intelligence whatsoever about what wealth management clients are doing right now, whether people are trying to withdraw their money or whether they're staying with Credit Suisse and saying, we appreciate the products that you provide and we're going to be uh, your clients for a longer period of time? Well, I guess it doesn't really matter. I mean, like if they take away the money or if they just like put it into a safe space, uh, the consequence for the Credit Suisse will be the same. I'm not so much concerned that they are losing deposits that have a, a liquidity issue, I would say. There are other uh, options in Europe where they can get liquidity from, and I'm pretty sure central banks will provide that. But the bigger issue here is like no matter what way your wealth management clients are doing, they will reduce risk. That means less fees, that means less revenue, that means less earnings, that means loss, less prospects for the stock price. So again, why buy the share in, in, this, in this situation? No incentive whatsoever. Jan Patrick, final question. Lisa and I talked about it a little bit early this morning. What would spook this market more tomorrow, if the ECB went 50 or didn't? <laughs> well, that's the, that's the interesting question I want to know, and I'm not so sure um, what it is. Like, it's, it's going to be horrible for central banks at this point because you have to put out five fires with just like one bucket of, of water. So I guess what they will try to do is like um, bring across the message to say like, OK, we've noticed uh, there's something going on that is not nice, and we take this into account <laughs> going forward. We will be less data dependent. We believe that inflation is going to come down anyway, especially if economic activity is now going down. And we will try everything to ensure that liquidity flows, especially in the banking sector, but across the economy, to make sure that we are not getting like a hard, hard lending 
that we are not hitting the wall. Um, but this communication we know is like very, very difficult for, um, for central banks to pull off, to make markets happy. So it's going to be very interesting to see um, how they want to do it. But I, if I have to make a bet, I would say, no matter what they say, the market won't be like uh, <laughs> super happy because they're not pulling out the bonanza at this point, I'm sure. They never do in the, in, in the first commentary, right? They always wait a little bit longer, but the market wants yeah. like the big measure and they're not getting that. Jan Patrick, thank you. Jan Patrick Barnett there. A Credit Suisse are going into central bank decisions. If you want to make a fool of someone right now, Tom, ask them for a forecast. The ECB has got to do that. The Federal Reserve has got to do that in the next week. I 100% agree. The uncertainty is just in every facet. No forecast. Futures right now on the S&P down 1.6%. Nurian Rabini up next. Equity futures right now on the S&P 500 down by 1.6% on the S&P. The thing you need to watch right now is Credit Suisse down by about 20%. Credit Suisse getting hammered this morning <clears throat> in and around 180. Session low, all-time low, 168. The story with the name this morning. First of all, we heard from the Credit Suisse chairman who ruled out state aid. Not a topic they want to discuss. Hardly a surprise. This was surprising in more ways than one. We heard from the Saudi National Bank chairman who said they will absolutely not provide more assistance to Credit Suisse. Mentioned the regulatory issue of going above 10% as a shareholder. I think we all understand that, but said there were other reasons as well, for many reasons, outside the simplest reason, which is regulatory and, and statutory. That's not helped out this name. It's an eight-day losing streak, 180 on Credit <coughs> Suisse. Talked briefly about futures, taking some pain in America. We're down 1.6%. Given the moves we've seen over the last week, that's not a monster move, is it? On the Nasdaq, we're down about 1.3%. The two-year bond in America has traded like a penny stock over the last week. It's down 22 basis points on a two-year. On a very pink close, sheets. Pink sheets. Very close to 3.99. Tom, 4.03. 4.03. Unreal. To Amazing. Get a 3.99. There. We're watching uh, American oil near 69 handle. John, I just need to bring us up to date on the 10-minute intervals on Credit Suisse. Yes, a bounce, but just up to one comfortable moving average. And now is where we see a real retest at 1.80. Do we go back down and look at 168, or do we actually get to a better place? Deeply uncomfortable for that company <clears throat> this morning. The moves you're seeing in the bond market with pricing out, rate hikes, pricing in, rate cuts, not just in America, but in Europe too. Looking to Germany, the two-year yield is much, much lower this morning. Tomorrow, ECB President Christine Lagarde, Elisa, has the unenviable task of working through these issues after seemingly pre-committing to a 50 basis point rate hike and now seemingly also stuck between a rock and a hard place because when we asked this question this morning, what would spook this market more, if they went 50 or if they didn't? And what does that mean about their visibility, their credibility, and their willingness to back up a financial system at a time when other people say that the broader economy is still doing really well and perhaps too well with respect to inflation? It's not just Credit Suisse. And this, I think, was making it very difficult. You're talking about bonds. You're talking about stocks. Take a look at European banks. If you look at the specific banks, SockGen down more than 11 percent. BNP down more than 11 percent. Commerce Bank down almost 10 percent. UBS down 7 percent. If you take a look at the banking index as a whole in Europe. It's down about 7% for the biggest drop going back a year. We're looking at a situation, John, where people are trying to extrapolate out what it would mean with respect to counterparty risk, with respect to other risk that might not be seen that's exacerbated by the rate hikes. They're trying to game that out both in the Europe and in the U.S. and then putting that into a scenario that used to be inflationary and now suddenly is not. It's so difficult, Lisa. No one knows. And Tom, for that reason, you de-risk and ask questions later. And that's what you're seeing develop this morning with European banks. And well. I have to stress this. We've had guest after guest now for weeks, <clears throat> months, talk up the trade of the year so far, I, which had been European banks to this point. Uh, in the crisis that we're in, you look to institutions, and I think everyone, as John Patrick Barnett just said, we're waiting for regulatory authorities to speak. They did that in America in a measured way, John. You and I and Lisa watched that tick by tick with Shanali Basak and others over a long weekend. In Switzerland, I suggest there's silence. You know, there's no other way to uh, put it. Right now, we're going to do, uh, John, continue to monitor Credit Suisse because I think. Yeah, I'll keep working on Bloomberg. Credit Suisse right now down 21%, <clears throat> Tom, 177. It's going to be interesting to see. We are well timed here. Joining us is David Rubenstein. You know him, of course, from the Carlisle Group, his public service to the nation and the Carter administration. And David Rubenstein, peer to peer conversations. And as David knows, I'm want to say, 
will rip up the script. Today we're going to rip up the script. I've got eight ways to go here. You, with your philanthropy, have a wonderful linkage between financial elites and the government. In America, we've seen the government begin to step in in this crisis. Are you surprised that European and particularly Swiss authorities have not stepped in on Credit Suisse? I am surprised that nothing has happened yet, but it took a day or two for the United States to get uh, its act together, so I suspect it'll take a day or two there. But remember, the U.S. regulatory scheme is much different than the Swiss one or the European one, and so we have one regulatory scheme, more or less, in the United States. They have many different ones in Europe, and I don't think the Swiss authorities have quite the authority mm -hmm. over the banking system that the U.S. one does have over our banking system. David, that's what I wanted to go to. What would you suppose stepping in? looks like in Switzerland? What does that look like? Well, what we did in the United States is we protected <laughs> depositors. So we didn't protect creditors, and we didn't protect shareholders, and we didn't protect really employees. Um, I suspect the Swiss situation is more complicated because the existence of the bank is more at stake uh, here, and it's such a well-known bank around the world that I think the Swiss authorities have uh, to worry more than just about the depositors. Uh, the chairman of the, Swiss, of the Saudi National Bank, who I do know, uh, made a statement that you broadcast recently uh, saying that they were not going to put more money in. And that would probably be a, a bit of a blow to Credit Suisse. Were you surprised by that, that he said that out loud on the record? I was surprised by it. I just uh, saw him a few weeks ago, and um, I think uh, you know they have a lot of authority in, uh, uh, in uh, Swiss, the Saudi National Bank. And I suspect they, they wanted to protect their investment, but obviously there's a reason why they're not doing that. Well, there's a theory that perhaps Middle Eastern investors would want to come in and help Credit Suisse more substantially, not just because they think it's a good investment, so that they could do business and have that be the European node. Is that basically off the table based on the very public comments that we heard earlier this morning? I don't have enough information to say that that's the case. I, I was surprised that the uh, Saudi National Bank chairman did not want to put more money in, but he may have be under some regulatory constraints to put more money in. So I just don't have all the facts there. But I do know that there's a lot of Middle East interest in, Swiss, in, Saudi, in, in uh, Credit Suisse, and over the years there have been a lot of uh, activity between the Credit Suisse and Middle East <coughs> bankers and Middle East investors. We'll just have to wait and see. David, you said that this is more complicated because of all the interconnectedness of Credit Suisse and the global banking system. And I'm wondering what your concern is, whether you think that the worry in market this morning markets uh, is warranted based on how systemic it really is. Well, I think in the United States, uh, the regulators thought over the weekend they had solved the problem. Clearly, they haven't really solved the problem because some banks are still um, weak, weaker than they would prefer to be. Uh, I think the contagion that spread to Europe is something that the regulators here probably did not anticipate. And so we'll just have to wait and see what the impact is. <clears throat> right now, the U.S. banking system is in pretty good shape. There's obviously some weak banks, but ba basically we don't have a mm -hmm. systemic run on the major banks in the United States. Um, I would say that Credit Suisse is a major bank in Europe, not as important as it was many years ago, but still an important bank. So if it were to have serious problems, it'd have a, more of a contagion effect than, than, than uh, Silicon Valley Bank would have on our uh, banking system. Some people talk, other people do. In March of 2008, you did. Carlyle Capital, to be polite, was challenged to be polite about it. You stepped up verbally and with action to help make people whole. How do we affect that now with this complex crisis that we have? Well, that was uh, something that was unanticipated by many people. It came about in part because uh, the, uh, the concerns about the regulatory system and interest rates were going up. I think here the Federal Reserve probably did not spend as much time worrying about the impact on banks and their uh, right. s ability to survive when interest rates were going up. The, the Fed was mostly focused, okay. I think, on inflation and not worried about the bank regulatory system. And I think they may have been caught uh, unaware of how serious the problem was. With so what should Powell do here? These are delicate questions. I don't want to put you in a corner, Mr. Rubenstein, but you've got tangible experience here. Well, my experience may not be that relevant for this, but I would say uh, the big decision that has to be made uh, by the Federal Reserve is do they increase interest rates by 50 basis points, 25 basis points or no basis points. And the conventional wisdom in Washington today, and that conventional wisdom is not always right, is that the Fed will probably go with 25 basis points. If they were to go with no, no increase at all, people would think that they've lost their interest in fighting inflation. If they go with 50 basis points, it might be seen as too much for some of the banking uh, uh, 
companies right now. So I suspect 25 basis points is the split the baby uh, decision that's most likely. Meanwhile, earlier this morning, we got this letter from BlackRock's Larry Fink, and he was talking about potentially a slow rolling crisis in the U.S. with the first shoe to drop, Silicon Valley Bank, the next with some regional banks. And then he pointed to a third shoe to drop where he pointed at private equity and he pointed to some of these less liquid assets that have built up in, in, in size over the past few years. Do you agree that that could be a node of concern in the next couple of months and year ahead? Private equity is not uh, the same situation as banks. Uh, we don't have typically runs on private equity firms. And so the bank, the private equity firms did quite well in the last recession. They survived it and they came back stronger than ever. The private equity firms are much bigger than they were the last time around. So I don't see any weakness at all that we have to worry about in terms of a regulatory uh, situation with private equity firms. I think we're not the problem. I think uh, other uh, banking regulated companies may have bigger problems but not private equity firms in my view. Uh, clearly, private equity firms have illiquid assets, but we've known that for a long time, and we don't have a run on the bank where we have depositors pulling their money out anytime they want to do so. So that's not a problem for us. We had a run on the bank elsewhere, and the decision that was made by authorities was to make depositors whole. We understood there was an FDIC limit on deposits of 250000 It looks like that's gone. Ken Griffin, I believe, spoke to the Financial Times re recently of Citadel and talked about may be eroding American capitalism, that this was perhaps a mistake. Do you take a view on that yet? Well, I think the Fed had, the federal government had to do something, and it, had they not protected depositors, there would have been runs on many banks. So I think by protecting depositors, I think that was a wise decision. Whether they should have protected creditors as well as shareholders, that's a more complicated issue. Um, Ken's a very smart person, has an outstanding record, and I, I know him quite well. I, I, right. I really respect him. But I, I don't think that uh, our capitalist system is falling apart. Um, it has challenges. It always has from, uh, from time to time. But right. I think the system is going to survive for sure. In the short time we have here, quickly, commercial real estate. I saw an Orange County shopping mall having challenges in the last 24 hours. Is commercial real estate the shadow you're concerned about? Well, when interest rates go up, commercial real estate values and other real estate values typically go down. So we've seen that impact right now. I, I suspect there are going to be some... Uh, dislocations in commercial real estate, but this has been going on for a while because uh, ever since uh, there was the tech bubble burst that we saw about a year or so ago, uh, real estate has been challenged, and as interest rates have gone up, real estate has been challenged, and I think the real estate developers are, are sensitive to this. I don't see a widespread uh, collapse in the real estate market at all. I think the real estate developers have learned their lessons from 10 years ago. They haven't made personal guarantees the way they used to, and I suspect that the industry will, will get through this. David, appreciate your time this morning. My we expected pleasure. to have a different conversation, but things are moving fast. Well, next time we'll talk about uh, my interview with, uh, I'm interviewing next week, uh, Jane Fraser, who is the CEO well, that's timely. of, that's uh, uh, timely. of yeah. Citibank, and I'll be doing that interview for Bloomberg and for others. So thank you. Very cool, David. Thank you. David Rubenstein there of the Carlisle Group. And just a programming note for you. You can watch David's interview with the former Commerce Secretary and PSP Partners Chairman Penny Pritzker on the David Rubenstein Show. Peer-to-peer -peer conversations tonight at 9pm in New York on Bloomberg TV. From New York City, with all eyes on Credit Suisse, we're down about 20.6%. It's a break of two. It's a break of 190. It's a break of 180. 178 on that stock right now. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. The Pentagon says a Russian fighter jet collided with a U.S. surveillance drone in international airspace above the Black Sea, causing the American aircraft to crash. Russia's defense ministry denies the claim. The U.S. European Command says the warplane struck the propeller of the Reaper drone. The State Department is calling it, quote, a brazen violation of international law. About half a million British workers are striking today as unions stage a mass walkout. Time to disrupt Chancellor of the Exchequer Jeremy Hunt's annual budget. Teachers, junior doctors, civil servants and the workers on the London Underground are expected to join picket lines with rallies and marches planned near Downing Street and the House of Parliament. Capital Subway is effectively shut down over a pension and working conditions dispute. Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida will meet with the head of the country's largest labor union today to try to encourage employers to raise wages. The wage talks have been attracting extra attention since Kishida called on companies to boost pay as part of his new so-called new capitalism policy, asking for raises that exceed inflation, which is at a four-decade high. In Pakistan, Iman...
Imran Khan supporters formed a human shield around his house as police got ready to storm the compound to arrest the former premier for the second time. A police spokesperson says the arrest warrants are to ensure Khan will appear in court to face charges of failing to disclose assets related to the sale of state gifts. The former prime minister has been skipping court appearances, citing threats to his life. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. I'm wondering whether you would be open to assisting further if there was another call for additional liquidity from Credit Suisse. The answer is absolutely not, for many reasons, outside the simplest reason, which is regulatory and statutory. We now own 9.8% um, of the bank. If we go above 10%, all kinds of new rules kick in, whether it be by our regulator or the European regulator or the Swiss regulator and we're not inclined to get into a new regulatory regime. The Saudi National Bank chairman speaking with a brilliant Youssef Gamal Aldin of Bloomberg. Those words shaking this stock. Top shareholder of Credit Suisse, not inclined to invest or provide any more assistance. Credit Suisse down 20%. It was a break of two this morning, then a break of 190, then a break of 180, 179. We're down to 20%. Session low, 168. There was a break of 170 in there too. It's been a long morning already. So Credit Suisse not doing well. That spills. It bleeds over elsewhere. Equity futures down by 1.7% on the S&P 500. Equity futures a whole lot softer. In the bond market, you'll see a move of 15 basis points on a 10-year. You go further inside to the two-year, front end of the curve, a move of 22 basis points. Briefly, a break of four again on a two-year. 4.02% <coughs> in America on a two-year Treasury. And Tom, just to have a look at <coughs> Germany briefly, down 27 basis points yeah. there, 262. Next week is Chairman Powell. Tomorrow, it's President Lagarde. Yeah, the global contagion here of Credit Suisse, there's no question we saw that earlier this morning. Right now, stasis in the stock trading at a 179. The technicals is mostly a dearth of selling going on now. That's different than two hours ago. Just a touch of buying on Credit Suisse, but the sellers are clearly uh, paused here to see for more information. Speaking of information and with an old world perspective, we are thrilled to have one of our good friends back. Noel Rubini is the CEO of Rubini Macro Associates, but far more than that, someone who brilliantly was out front of previous crises. We'll keep the uh, introduction short uh, this morning. Noriel, good morning to you. How is this crisis different than 98? How is this crisis different than 2008? Well, compared to 2008 right now, we don't have the credit risk yet. We're not in a recession, and the losses that occurred seem to be related to market risk. A number of financial institutions did not realize that with rising interest rates, the price of bonds would fall. And last year, uh, U.S. banks alone have something like $620 billion of unrealized losses on their securities with a capital of about $2.2 mm -hmm. trillion. So the average loss is about 28%, will reduce significantly their capital ratio, the tier one ratio. And for some banks, actually, the numbers like uh, uh, Silicon Valley Bank, of course, the number was 100%. But there are still other regional banks where right. if they had to real losses, there'll be 50% of their current capital. No, so I, I, want, I want to go back to your Italian economics, your public service to President uh, Clinton, where you were expert on the regulatory framework. Switzerland is a devolved federal government with the cantons with great strength. What is your knowledge of Swiss regulators right now? How removed are they from the Credit Suisse crisis? Or they, can they be active today to help their beleaguered bank? Well, uh, they can be active today, even if they have a system that is uh, delegated. However, the problem is that Credit Suisse, by some standards, might be too big to fail, but also too big to be saved. It's not clear that unlike the United States, the federal system has enough resources to engineer a bailout. And uh, what they need certainly is more capital. And the question is whether they're going to get that capital or not. Otherwise, bad things can happen. Well, bad things are happening this morning. Noriel, I'd love your take on yeah. this. There might be some people waking up 
this morning, looking at what's happening with Credit Suisse, perhaps ba perhaps based here in the United States, and thinking, what does this mean for me? Why is this important? Could you explain to those people, Nouriel, just how important Credit Suisse might be to the financial system? Well, it's important because SVP was only about a $150 billion of assets, while in the case of Credit Suisse, we're speaking about at least $700 billion. So anything will happen to Credit Suisse will be of systemic effect for not just the European financial system, but also for the global financial system. So if, uh, if Silicon Valley Bank creates a ripple effects in global financial market, something bad happening to Credit Suisse will be an order of magnitude more severe, something more like a Lehman moment. A lot of people are, are talking about the implications of this on monetary policy. And Torsten Slock earlier said, when the facts change, his view changes from no landing to a hard landing. He sees uh, perhaps the end of a rate hiking cycle, as does the market, including 100 basis points of cuts in the next year. Nouriel, do you agree with this assessment? Have the facts changed where suddenly rate hikes are out of the picture and you see that the inflation story will get solved by a, a crisis elsewhere? Uh, I don't think so. I think that the dilemma for central bank has gotten even worse because the latest economic data for inflation in the Eurozone or the U.S. suggests that inflation is still too high, is falling, but is not falling as fast as the Fed or ECB want it to be. So based on what's the economy doing right now, we need to hike and hike much more. The Fed should go at least closer to 6 percent. The ECB should bring the deeper rate to at least 4 percent. The problem right now, we're facing a situation of financial instability, and financial instability would suggest to stop hiking, maybe even cutting rates, maybe even resuming quantitative easing. And what the Fed has done is backdoor quantitative easing. But if you do that, you have a risk of the anchoring of inflation, inflation expectation. That trade-off existed even before. Raising rates would have led to stresses in financial market, like last year, where bond yields went much higher, credit spread widened. That stress is becoming more severe today because now we have systemic financial problems, but we are also in a situation where inflation is staying way too high. And the idea that this financial stress is going to cause inflation to drop is not yet in the economic data. So there is a dilemma for central banks. Although a lot of people are saying that they see credit conditions tightening. We heard earlier from Larry Fink of BlackRock saying that he sees a slow rolling crisis that's going to move from the banking system to private credit, to private equity. How does your view kind of tie into this, a sort of inherent credit tightening that we see across a whole host of assets? Certainly there's going to be a tightening of financial conditions, at least in terms of credit spreads. Bond yields are falling, but on the short and long end, that's an easing of financial condition that eventually might lead to an economic slowdown. But the reality is inflation today is way too high and it's going to remain too high because the forces that are leading to high inflation, like, for example, very tight labor market are still with us. And therefore, that's going to be a cause of persistent inflation. And the idea that eventually it's tightening of financial conditions is going to cause a slowdown of the economy and a weakening of inflation is not yet in the data. So there is a real contradiction between achieving economic stability and lower inflation and maintaining financial stability today. What a conflict. What a conflict. Nuri, I've got 45 seconds left. I wanted to give the opportunity to try and answer this. Banks found out that a risk was where they thought the safety was. Nuri, where's the safety now? Well, the safety is not in long-term treasuries. I've been writing for it for over a year. You know, if average inflation were to be, say, 5%, 10-year treasury eventually have to be 7%. Today, they're around 35 Last year, you lost 20% on your safe bonds, more than you lost on your S&P because yield went from 1 towards 3. If they go from 35 to 7 over the medium term, there'll be further bloodbath on $20 trillion of long-duration risk assets. The solution is going to be short-term treasury, tips, gold, precious metals, and other hedges against inflation. That's where you have to go. And investors only now have started to realize it, that that's where you have to do. It's going to be a conversation you and I have, the whole of this team, for a long time. Nouria, thank you, sir. Nouria Rabini there of Rabini Macro Associates and Tom, of course, the author of Mega well, Threats. Yeah, Mega Threats. And then there's a chapter where Rabini was typically three years out front of everybody else. I'm not going to bore people with my Davos story with Nor Noriel before the financial crisis. There's no time for that. But he talked about the easy money trap. 
And that's what Taleb was talking about when he said the gravity's return to the system. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to be blunt, and it's not just us. It's the, you know, we got 45 people in the control room. And it's just, I'm, I'm sorry, John, it is critical how out front our bookers, our team has been on the gravity returning to the system this year in full force. We've got a fantastic guest lined up for you next, Lisa Shannon of Morgan Stanley. That's coming up next. Equity futures down 1.75% on the S&P. Credit suites lower by 20% from New York. This is Bloomberg. Fed to actually pause or cut, it's going to send a pretty negative signal. If the Fed does not hike next week, there will be real questions about whether the Fed is also committed to price stability. Inflation still is a concern, but they have to address the current environment. The Fed's trying to tighten things up and realizing that it's not that easy. This stress in the system now tightens financial conditions and is a warning about the lagged effects of monetary policy. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramowitz, Tom Keen on radio, on television. Another day, a financial crisis, this time worldwide. It is simple as this. It is about Zurich and Credit Suisse. It is about Cabot Square in London and Credit Suisse. And dare I say, of a Credit Suisse first Boston attempting to be built in New York. John, it's global. It's global in a major way, and it starts with Credit Suisse this morning, at least. The stock is down by almost 23%, just off session lows, just off record lows, 173, 172, the record low, 168, a little bit earlier this morning. The news, it comes from the top shareholder, the Saudi National Bank chairman speaking to Bloomberg and saying, will you provide more assistance? Absolutely not. For many reasons outside the simplest reason, which is regulatory and statutory, we understand the regulatory issues of crossing that 10% threshold as a shareholder. But Tom, again, I've said it repeatedly, we all have through this morning, to say that out loud when the stock is down as much as it is. And now it's down even more. I'm going to interrupt for technical, for radio rather, and technical analysis. The stock is well contained and trending down. A straight line pause at 177. And moments ago, when John Farrell began speaking, the stock went lower 170, 1.70, perhaps to test 1.68. John, I don't understand what U.S. regulators of Credit Suisse in, in New York and what FSA and the like do in London at Cabot Square. What do they do? Dial 1 800 Swiss National Bank and say, let's go? And no idea. And what are they meant to do? <clears throat> What's anyone meant to do at this point? Is there a solution? Do they need a solution? I've got no idea. I won't speak for the regulator. It's not the time. I think we've got to have some cool heads here looking at this name, which is really taking a major, major hit in today's session. The monetary policy question is fascinating. President Lagarde's got to go tomorrow. She pre-committed to 50, right. basically. Will she go with 50 next week as <clears throat> Chairman Powell? I keep saying this. In a world where a bank seemingly can just break, snap, in 24 hours. A week is a long time for this chairman. A week ago today, we opened this program and we were talking about, do we go 50? How low is the bar for that? I think the bar is monster, monster high to go well, 50 next week, Tom, even with the data. Uh, maybe had. we're going to get a test here in a moment. 1.68 right now. We'll get a new low here in a bit. Lisa, what have you learned this morning? What have you learned in the last hour? That the bank contagion, or at least the fear of it, is anything but gone. People had hoped for stability. That is off the table. We are now pricing in 100 basis points of rate cuts in the next 12 months, even sooner than that. How much do we get a response from central banks? And is the tightening, I mean, to Nouriel Rubini's point earlier, this question of we still have an inflation problem, otherwise we'd be talking about CPI, PPI coming out in half an hour, retail sales coming out in a half an hour, labor market that's running hot. How do you deal with the inflation problem at a time where something seems to be breaking and people are very well, concerned about that? Let's break to the data check right now, John. It's sporting with the VIX. He had four big figures earlier, 27.47. So we're sitting on the lows of Credit Suisse's <clears throat> stock. It's down 25 percent. It's back down to 168 in the last five minutes or so. If you take a look at what's happening in Europe, Socgen is down 13%. BNP Paribas is down 11 or 12%. And this won't be lost on many of you listening, watching. A week ago, we were talking about this being the trade of the year so far. People wanted to own this story. Europe, the economy doing better. The ECB seemingly is going to keep on hiking. 
and then all of a sudden it looks like things are starting to break. It started last week, it bleeds through to this week. Sockgen Tom down more than 12%, BNP down more than 11 Commerce Bank down by almost 10 <clears throat> And then we saw the Standard & Poor's 500 futures, negative 73 now, John, come down as well. I really think we need, particularly for America, waking up here and to get to our good guest here in a moment, John, we've got to say this has not only a global banking tinge, but also, uh, granted, off IEA and OECD, we're seeing a, a G- global GDP slowdown with a 69 print for a moment on West Texas Intermediate. Tom, we're seeing headlines that you don't typically see, and this is from the Deutsche Bank CEO, Christian Saving, the deposits are diversified at Deutsche Bank, they're sticky. That's the kind of moment we're in. you have to say it. I I, I agree that that's the kind of moment we're in, that they've got to come out and say these things out loud, that we don't have a problem here. Deposits are diversified, they're sticky. Ultimately, that's a nod towards this idea that we're not SVP. Those deposits were not diversified, they were not sticky. Uh, My Bloomberg, there's a silence here to the Credit Suisse trading. We're going to get reporting on that in a moment. We had a number of halts through the morning. We have to be careful on that. 1.6805 on that. Joining us now with wonderful perspective is we had David Rubenstein earlier and Dr. Rubini. Lisa Shallot joins the chief investment officer for Morgan Stanley Wealth Management. It would be inappropriate for her to speak for Mr. Gorman and the executives of Morgan Stanley activity in the last four hours. Lisa, I must ask, because you are with Wealth Management, how do you contain the phone calls? How do you contain deposit inflows of a certain flight to quality? Look, I think the most important thing that we're talking to clients about right now is getting folks to understand the difference between what happened in the great financial crisis in 2007 and 2008 and what's happening now. Uh, In 2007, 2008, we had a massive credit problem. Uh, There was a quality of credit uh, default risk uh, set of issues. Uh, this go round, the the assets that need to be revalued are not, you know, mortgages and real estate. Uh, they are in in many cases, you know, sovereign bonds of governments, uh, and those are very different things. And so, you know, for the handful of banks that have found themselves in a, a situation where their funding model on the asset side of their balance sheet. Uh, you know, needs to be or or should have been more aggressively marked and and risk managed. Uh, that's really the issue. What what is fascinating here is the role of psychology, right? When you get bank runs, when you get depositors starting to worry about uh, you know the integrity of their deposits, that is a very different, very different dynamic. And I could suggest to you that there is a scenario where you know the situation at Silicon National Bank did not have to happen uh, if all of the folks uh, who were the major deposit holders, who were major holders of loans there, who were major account holders, didn't suddenly in mass decide uh, not only to all withdraw at the same time, but to literally put that on social media as uh, an action. Uh, you know, that we are living in very, very different times. Yep. And um, we have to kind of understand how important it is, uh, the role that regulators play, the role that, uh, you know, capital reserves and capital buffers play, and how important, you know, having uh, the integrity of those stress tests uh, is. And so we talk about, you know, there are the haves and, and you know, the less haves. Uh, and the folks who've really, you know, been put through those paces uh, and those stress tests and the folks who have been allowed uh, because of their size or their organizational structure uh, to perhaps experience, you know, quote unquote, a lighter touch of that regulatory oversight. Lisa, there is a back of the envelope conversation happening right now. Maybe it's too simplistic, but it goes a little something like this. After what we saw develop in the United States last week, the focus quickly went back on duration risk, the mismanagement of interest rate exposure, interest rate risk. And Lisa, because of that, I think given the losses you've seen in treasuries over the last 12 months, people just instantly said, well, wait a minute, what about Europe and what we've seen develop there in the last year, Lisa? Can you speak to that? Uh, Yeah, look, I I think, um, you know, this is a huge wake-up call. It's a wake-up call, however, 
uh, that that shouldn't be a brand new thing. Um, you know, understanding if you're going to own financials, if you're going to be an investor in that sector, uh, you know, understanding the funding model, understanding, you know, how a bank is generating, uh, you know, cash flows to pay depositors and to attract uh, depositors is a key part of your fundamental analysis. And so there's an element of this, you know, where 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 this is less about uh, immediate contagion. Again, remember in the great financial crisis, there was a lot of this that was about, you know, cross counterparty credit risk. That's not what this is about. These are about individual banks uh, who potentially uh, have not, you know, were overly aggressive in, in funding themselves out the curve uh, during an episode of central bank tightening. Uh, and, you know, that is, a you know, one could say, you know, somewhat, you know, uh, economics 101. Uh, and uh, so I do I think that there may be some other mistakes out there. Uh, yes, I do. Uh, but I do think that that the systemic interconnection of them is very different than in 2008. Uh, 2007, 2008. Just quickly, Lisa, given that perhaps you don't see the systemic relevance in the same kind of way as 2008, do you still think that it's important for the central banks to hike rates to combat inflation, to make sure that inflation doesn't get out of hand in the longer term? Or do you think that there is enough breaking that it's time to pause? Um, I, unfortunately, you know, I have worried about central banks being late to the party uh, on this inflation challenge. Uh, I think that uh, if central bank credibility has a chance of being preserved, uh, I think that uh, the Fed especially, uh, and then secondarily, the ECB needs to continue on their tightening campaign. They need to make clear, uh, as they have, what their intentions are, that their goal is to fight uh, inflation, to defend the integrity of you know, these fiat currencies. Uh, and uh, not doing so has much longer term structural damage to, to uh, the economy in terms of inflation risk premiums, <laughs> overall policy term premiums, and turns into higher for longer rates over long periods of time. So, um, you know, look, for the Fed, you know, they're, they're out is that, you know, the regulatory um, and examinatory part of the Fed is separate from the central bank operations, open market operations. Um, they've got to kind of stay the course, in my humble opinion. And, and I think to do anything else um, at this juncture, at least, uh, would really be uh, a misstep. Lisa, thanks for being with us. Lisa Shallot of Morgan Stanley Wealth Management has been cautious all year and has not chased the rally that developed at all. Equity futures softer, Credit Suisse down 24%. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. The International Energy Agency says global oil markets are contending with a surplus as Russian production defies predictions of a slump and fuel demand slowly picks up. Oil stockpiles have climbed to the highest in 18 months, with Russia increasing output last month, despite warnings it would buckle under international sanctions. The IEA has boosted its Russian output estimate by 300,000 barrels a day. Credit Suisse's chief executive officer says the bank had seen inflows of client funds on Monday after markets and U.S. banks were pummeled by the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank. So far, it's pretty calm. Um, we even saw material good inflows yesterday still. Um, also, you know, I had a client meeting which was very positive on that one. So, so far it's calm, but I think it's early days to, to look at that. Ulrich Corner spoke exclusively to Bloomberg. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg.
wondering whether you would be open to assisting further if there was another call for additional liquidity from Credit Suisse. The answer is absolutely not, for many reasons, outside the simplest reason, which is regulatory and statutory. We now own 9.8% um, of the bank. If we go above 10%, all kinds of new rules kick in, whether it be by our regulator or the European regulator or the Swiss regulator, and we're not inclined to get into a new regulatory regime. I wonder if we get a clarification on those remarks before the day is out. That was the Saudi National Bank Chairman speaking with Bloomberg's Youssef Gamal out in. Those words rocking <clears throat> this stock, not exactly a ringing endorsement. The first couple of words of that sentence, especially. Looking at this stock move, we're down 25%. We've got a new record low, Tom. 167 print, briefly, back to about 168 at the moment. Right. And I think there's a few ways to look at this, and we've talked about it all morning. One, you can say, you're stating the obvious here. They don't want to go above 10%. There's a regulatory issue once you do. I get all that, but to say it out loud, one and two, to say there were other I, reasons as well. I would suggest. And three, to start yeah. with the response with absolutely not. Well, right? this, this not is helpful. But, but this not is helpful. What, let's go to military. This is what Stravitas would say it's the unexpected. And, you know, that's the worry here. And this was unexpected. Youssef's interview is made global news. Every single entity is watching it as the market reacts. And the market deteriorated in the last 15 minutes. John, yeah. the technical analysis here is simple. On Credit Suisse, this is an exceptionally elegant chart and well-behaved. The sellers, uh, there's a dearth of selling right now, not like we saw at 6 and 7 a.m., but here at 8.17 a.m., I'm going to suggest we're seeing a renewed point where the buyers pull back, and that's how you go to a 1.67. So just to add two more things, if I can, 1.66 moments ago. Yeah, it's a new record low. One, certainly <clears throat> the issues that this bank faces right now have nothing to do with Saudi National Bank or the chairman. This yes. has been developing yes, for well a said. long, long Yeah, we time. need to so say that. Yes. Let's put that out there. Number one, if you've just started to follow this story, we've been following this for the best part of 18 months now, and the issues with this bank go back, I would say, a decade. And they've tried to help provide assistance by becoming the top shareholder in Saudi, in <clears throat> Credit Suisse, rather, at the Saudi National Bank. But I'll say this also. Days like today, moments like the moments we're in right now, Lisa, you just have to be so careful with your words the language you use, the way you talk about whatever's happening because things like this can happen quickly. It's an emotional response, and you don't want to fuel it inappropriately because right now we're talking about one shareholder talking about additional assistance. It's theoretical, yes. That said, when you take a step back, people are worried about the next shoe to drop. And I go back to what Larry Fink over at BlackRock said. He is concerned about that cascade effect as we realize what higher rates exposes the vulnerabilities that it just makes that much more painful. And we heard from David Rubenstein earlier of Carlisle, whose Carlisle Capital was challenged in 2008 to be polite about it. And Mr. Rubenstein said Switzerland is different. Again, our Jean-Patrick Barnett, who's led our coverage in Frankfurt, Germany, with his European banking experience as well. Where in God's name are the regulators, John Patrick? I mean, I guess our reporting, our team's reporting, but with all of your bank experience before journalism, in America, they'd be full front right now. Where are they? Well, I mean, European regulators are not known for being uh, the first out of the door when you have any kind of, of crisis. They're usually uh, rather reactive than um, being being at the forefront here. But but let me say this, because like there were some critical voices out there saying um, people are too harsh on, on Credit Suisse and there is no, um, no issue, issue on liquidity. <laughs> Let's put that all aside. Let's say like there is all safe and sound in the whole banking system around the world. Liquidity is good. Nobody's going bankrupt, right? Let's just face the facts, and that's why Credit Suisse is being hammered so much this morning. And that's why the regulator probably is also going to struggle to help, is the bank simply has an earnings issue. And everything that is happening now with a potential tightening of credit conditions, a potential recession, a potential uh, reduction in interest rates again, this will all eat into earnings. And that's what shares are pricing, and that's why the shares are getting hammered. If you then get, of course, an, a big shareholder, and I guess it was just like, um, speaking his mind there, 
not providing immediate backup, then you could create further issues. Because like, let's say the other banks, why the other banks not so not down that much? Because they probably have still the opportunity if uh, things come to, if push comes to shove, to say like, oh, well, let's go to the market. We are in a solid state. We have a working business model. We have good earnings. They will recover when recession is over. Let's just pull in some new fresh capital and, and off we go. Credit Suisse will have a very hard time to do that should they need to do it for whatever reason. And that's what the market is also pricing. So it's not about to say that Credit Suisse has a liquidity issue or whatever. It's just the fact earnings are going to suffer and you will have a hard time to provide new capital if you need to. And that's why investors are so careful. Jan Patrick on Bloomberg TV, there is a promo for this show. And I'll, I'll summarize it as follows. I say something like, what does it mean when the White House says they're looking at markets? And Tom laughs and says, I can't remember what I said. I've got a Bloomberg or something like they, that. They, anyway, they we, both, we, we all hate that promo. It plays we, every 10 we minutes. Have, but they, they have a Bloomberg at SMB. Something like that. And they we all have, laugh about it. We hate the promo. But ultimately, Jan Patrick, <laughs> it's kind of relevant this morning. Because whenever you hear from officials and they say things like, we're watching it carefully, or wherever you hear from investors that say, we have faith in management's ability to turn this around, it always feels pretty hollow. But, Jan Patrick, this morning, we haven't got any of that. <laughs> and you've got the S&B, the Swiss <laughs> National Bank, who comes out and says something like they declined to comment on Credit Suisse. Are we saying this story this morning could be different if the Swiss National Bank came out and said, we're watching this carefully? And if the Saudi National Bank chairman came out and said, we have full faith in the leadership at Credit Suisse? Are you saying that makes a difference? Absolutely not, in in my view. We have a totally different situation here, and I have all understanding for the regulator I'm not making a comment at this point because the thing is like, I believe whatever they would say, unless it's like some really drastic measure, and we are far off that point uh, here, um, the, the market wouldn't really care. What we're doing right here, like, is within banking stocks and within the global equity market, is like we are doing a repositioning, in my view, pretty hard and pretty sudden. Everybody felt so comfortable in this inflation is gradually coming down. Um, we are all good here. Soft landing. Everything is fine. That was priced for the last three to four months in equity markets. And there were some good reasons to do so. And this whole scenario is now out of the window. And now you have to reposition. And of course, the banking stocks are at the forefront. So that's why people are selling them. And then again, in this forefront, in this first line of defense where the stuff is hitting, you're selling the weakest cheaps twice as much, and sorry to say so, no offense to Credit Suisse, but among the banking crowd, it is the weakest stock at this moment for everything I said before, earnings impact uh, back up from potential investors. So it all makes sense. And the regulator and politicians in general, they can do very little to change that, right? Because the, the market forces yeah. on the economy will just play out at this so point. And when it becomes very big, bad, then we will see if they have to do something to, to uh, give us a little bit of a lifeline here. Jan Patrick, just quickly here, how thick is the line between a profitability issue and a liquidity issue? Well, it is thick, but I would say like it's not that thick that we have to immediately talk about like a liquidity problem for, for Credit Suisse. European banks have uh, lots of access to liquidity. Credit Suisse has tons of deposits. And I'm not seeing that the, the classic Credit Suisse client is running away immediately. Still, it can be an issue down the road. And of course, every bank is now making sure that their shop is in order. Um, and Credit Suisse probably has, again, here a harder time than other European banks um, bringing across that message to its clients. It's a tough time, not just for the clients, but for the people working there too. Jan Patrick Barnett, thank you <clears throat> on the latest from Bloomberg. Credit Suisse down 26%. New low, Tom, 164. We've said it repeatedly. Well, we all know people who work at Credit Suisse, immensely talented individuals. Imagine trying to work through this this morning and engage with clients well, and you, do work that, looking at this That's the heart of the stock. matter. In, in New York, down at Madison Avenue, at Cabot Square in London, et cetera, how do you engage a conversation? Uh, right now, 168, make it maybe 169, bouncing off a of 164 at low. Sellers are really on strike here. It's just a dearth of buying is, is what I see. I was using my vast German knowledge, uh, John. Folge dem Geld which is follow the money. And, you know, John Patrick was talking there about profitability. I would be talking about flows right now.
I think, immediate flows. And it's not just this bank. There's many other banks where that's the case. I think that's the question. You know, when does this become not just a profitability <clears throat> issue, but something that, that is more significant? And I think that that's what you're seeing the tension in shares of other European and U.S. banks. Conversation continues in the next hour on Bloomberg TV. Julian Emanuel of Evercore, Emily Rowland of John Hancock, Investment Management, Bob Michael of J.P. Morgan. Looking forward to that conversation in the next hour on Bloomberg TV. Futures right now on the S&P down 1.75%. Welcome you across this nation on radio, on television, and worldwide for what has become a global bank crisis. Credit Suisse challenged over the last number of days. Lisa Bramwitz, moments ago, we have a 159 print on Credit Suisse. I'm going to say technically, Lisa Abramowitz, it is well contained. Well, and this is really the question. What <clears throat> is going to not only trigger the uh, perhaps stability, but then also a revival mm -hmm. after its top shareholder said he was ruling out further aid for this bank? Well contained in our non-economics this morning is the patience of Michael McKee in charge of international economics amid bank crisis, and he has retail sales for us. Michael, what do you see? <laughs> We've got PPI and retail sales. Let's start with retail sales. The consumer stopped spending in February, it appears. Uh, retail sales headline number down four-tenths. X Autos is down <clears throat> one-tenth. Uh, and if you take the control group, uh, there is some better news because that was up half a percent, the expectation was for a fall of three-tenths. Last month, the uh, number for the control group mm -hmm. was revised higher uh, significantly <clears throat> to 2.3% from 1.7%. All of the numbers for last month revised uh, revised higher. Uh, the headline retail sales was up 3.2%. The original report was 3%. Right. So generally with retail sales, you tend to average out over a couple of months, and it does show that Americans were still spending. They did pull back in some areas. Areas. PPI down a tenth of a percent. It was forecast to go up three tenths and it rose seven tenths in January. So there's some good news. The core rate is flat after a half percent gain last month and a four tenths gain forecast. Right. You take out uh, <clears throat> food, energy, and trade. Trade is not trade, international trade. This is uh, retailers and wholesalers, and uh, it's their profit margins. That's up two-tenths mm -hmm. of a percent, down from six-tenths, but it does show, uh, right. so it shows some uh, fall there. Uh, on a year-over-year -year basis, 4.6 percent for the headline, 4.4 percent for the core. Uh, right, we're going to juggle oh, this. Oh, uh, ju uh, Tom, I got to throw this in there, please, because this may move the markets. Empire Manufacturing. Yeah, I saw that. Down 24.6 is uh, right. the number. It was negative 5.8. Now it's negative 24.6. So uh, real dry right. up there in uh, the Empire Manufacturing numbers. New orders okay. plunged we're, down to negative 21. We're going to do this differently this time because we've got a number of moving uh, stories here and an exceptionally esteemed guest to join us in uh, seconds here. Mike, I want to move away from this economic data to your interpretation and reading in the last 24 hours of how this Fed will respond to your economic data and our financial crisis. What would you guess they will do? Well, I don't think the data today makes any difference to the Fed. Uh, the empire is a sort of tertiary index, and retail sales uh, show Americans are still hanging in there, but maybe spending a little less, which they'd like mm -hmm. to see some well, demand come down. And PPI isn't going to uh, change everybody's minds because right. it's it's come down. Right. So therefore, that. Puts Mike, 25. Mike, you and I look at retail. We look at Credit Suisse. Bramo looks at the two-year. Yeah, that's what we all <laughs> should be looking at because what you're seeing is a complete breakdown. Down below 4%, 3.88%. As basically, this is a market that has looked at PPI, inflation in the factories <clears throat> coming down much more than expected. Retail sales diminishing as expected. And then a weak Empire yeah. Manufacturing print. We are looking <clears throat> at a market that's pricing out any further rate hikes and pricing well, out 100 basis points. Points or That's more of great cuts. But you're a tennis fan, okay, right? I know you like tennis. And this is like going back and forth with the uh, the bond trading. I mean, bond traders got to be going crazy. Their, uh, their accountants are happy well, because, of course, volatility is good for profits. But it's hard to get a read on what's going on with the economy when you're just looking at yields right now because they're being pushed around so well, much by all kinds of news. The, uh, uh, so the yield where will they be? 
a week from today. The yield on the published dividend of Credit Suisse continues to rise as the price declines 1.6. Uh, oh, I think we maybe even have I, I'll stop trading. I'm going to be very careful here in Credit Suisse. The low is 1.5975 quickly. Well, to that point, if you take a look at German <clears throat> two-year yields, dropping like a stone as well, 2.54 percent. Yeah. Again, what does this mean? Is this economic data enough to write off further rate hikes, or is this a concern about Credit Suisse? Is this a concern about the financial markets? Something right. breaking at a time of potential real fragility. It's a bigger concern for the ECB because they meet tomorrow. The right. Fed has a week. ECB's tomorrow, and we need some experience. Uh, Lisa, it's interesting that Michael McKee is here on, what is it, Mike, 15 years back to Bear Stearns, uh, 15 years yesterday? 15 years think, yesterday, yes. That's me the most difficult thing here is I would have guessed seven or eight years. I got that wrong. And also joining us, someone who is uh, still time here with Mizuo over those many years. Stephen at Rochetto joins us, chief U.S. economist at Mizuo Americas in 2008 and in, uh, in, in uh, 2023. Steve, I'm going to cut to the chase with West Texas Intermediate giving us a 69 a bit ago. Lisa mentions a two-year yield as well. Forget about curve inversion in recession calls. Do the parts of the American economy deteriorate given bank crisis? Well, I think in this day and age, there's less dependence on bank markets than there are on credit markets. That's number one. Number two, there's ample liquidity in the system. We are in a free reserve system as opposed to a borrowed reserve system. <coughs> Three, the Federal Reserve, the FDIC, and the Treasury, probably in the order of FDIC, Treasury, and the Federal Reserve, took very aggressive response to the um, Silicon Valley situation, the signature bank situation. So I think when you roll it all together, there is going to be less of a real macro impact to this than there is a financial market impact. All that being what we say, I mean, you have to understand we had a forecast of a second half recession. We're likely now to have an increased probability of that as a result of the developments that we're seeing. And as a precautionary environment, I would assume the Federal Reserve would probably do something like hike rates in March and then go into a pause, see where the dust settles, um, and let the markets go from there and give it some time, probably the three to six month period of time before they then change policy again. So let's link the financial markets to the real economy, because in the real economy, we are seeing disinflation, at least when it comes to PPI. We are seeing a bit of cooling, and yet other aspects of the economy seem to not be what we got yesterday. So what's the real economy doing, and how quickly will it respond to what we're seeing in financial markets? Well, again, you have to understand, if this is not a systemic credit crunch, it is not a massive decline in the underlying macroeconomic environment. It's a shallow-type recessionary environment. So it takes time to bring all these things to coalesce, to bring down the rate of inflation and the rate of growth enough to rebound balance the labor market. And it's an imbalanced labor market that is really the key here and continues to be the underlying driver of the underlying economic activity. If people aren't getting fired, if people are comfortable with their jobs, they're comfortable willing to quit their jobs and move on, these are the people who are going to continue to spend money. And spending money is what drives the economy. I go back to what Noriel Rubini was talking about. There is this dual mandate for the Federal Reserve. Financial stability is one of them, or many mandates. Uh, employment, full employment is another. And then they also have to fight inflation, a very uncomfortable mix right now. I'm wondering from your vantage point, which should take precedence at their meeting next week? Well, I think that that's a good question. I think what they've decided to do, and the chairman indicated this in his mid-year monetary policy report to Congress, or I should say his, his, his February monetary report to Congress, he made it quite clear the Fed's trying to separate the two roles. Um, and I think this comes through in terms of people misreading this whole idea of the new lending facility as a quantitative easing. It's not. Yes, it increases the asset side of the Fed's balance sheet to the extent that it's taken down, but it doesn't change the portfolio of the Federal Reserve. <clears throat> and they're looking at trying to separate the two mm -hmm. concepts. It's regulatory approach. It's uh, it's regulatory approach to policy versus its policy with regard right. to inflation in the labor market, and that's a tough balance for them. But I think they're pulling it off nicely, and I think the right. term lending facility that they instituted should become a permanent facility, I, just like I, RRP I, did. I need to stop and say that you and your colleague Dominic Constant absolutely nailed the super restrictive nature of the moment six or eight weeks ago. You were lonely on that, and I think you did a great uh, job. Part of that super restriction, restriction is it redounds to commercial real estate. What do you suggest the shadows of commercial real estate will mean, obviously, for economic growth? but also for our general financial well-being. You know, when you're looking at the different areas that lead to underlying economic activity, 
tech space is clearly in a in a setback mode. Financial sector is clearly in a setback mode. Commercial real estate has been an ongoing train wreck for quite some time, and it's a train wreck. Did you that speak has been more clearly there? Do you want to, yeah. <laughs> train wreck is CFA yes. level four. It's it's it's, it's been a fairly slow <clears throat> train wreck. Um, to the extent that it accelerates, you got to remember the banks that are involved in this and the people who are involved in this on the asset side uh, and the investing side all have a uh, vested interest in restructuring these deals uh, to in order to make them less of an importance in any one in particular quarter. Doesn't mean it doesn't have an impact in terms of the growth. It adds to the story and helps lead you to an environment where you have a tight labor market driving consumer spending, but you have all these other factors pulling back, which is why you probably get to the shallow recession forecast rather than the hard recession forecast that you normally follows if you were have a systemic credit issue. We heard from BlackRock's Larry Fink. He put out a letter and he was talking about a concern about a slow rolling crisis that unfolds that first hits SVB, Silicon Valley Bank, and then regional banks, and then moves to the private markets that you were just talking about, the train wreck and commercial real estate, as you put it. I'm wondering, at what point does it become the most important for the economy, for slowing inflation, for losing jobs, for all of these metrics that people have been looking for as sort of a side effect, a negative one, a very negative one, of this tightening? You know, if you wind up in a situation where the quote-unquote shadow bank was to be perceived to being at risk, then I think you could be in that environment. The problem you have to understand is this shadow banking industry has built up an enormous <clears throat> amount of reserves. They have been fearful of this. A lot of them come out of the legacy of GECC. They saw what happened there. They understand if you don't have the right reserves in the system. Now, again, fear can overwhelm the financials, and we've seen that. Right now, we aren't, aren't in that position, so therefore, it's a little hard to speculate whether we will go that route, especially given the fact that they've mm -hmm. so successfully, I think, ring-fenced the banking industry. You know, this term lending facility, as I said, I think should become permanent, and the reason why is because going to the discount window has become so terribly concerning for any management, right, they won't right, use it. Right, right, I mean, so, that's all this is. I, 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 we got, I want to talk to Steve forever. Can we make <laughs> this happen? 12 seconds. You're right. It's a new discount window. Period. Correct. And it's a discount window window that gives you an opportunity to restructure the bank because right. it's a one-year term. Okay. you got to stop talking. Markets are going down. Rusciuto's driving the market lower is what we see here. Stephen Rusciuto, Mizzou Americas. Lisa, help me here. The two-year yield, you'll nailed well under 4%, 3.92%. Lisa, look at American oil this morning. Yeah, what you're seeing is, at first, it was a response to potentially uh, the IEA report coming out that China, that Russia was pumping a lot more oil than previously expected. Now, this is a, a bigger concern about... You know, the potential for right. some global slowdown, 69.86 on uh, crude on WTI. We have a breakdown in the equity markets called a 2% move. Standard & Poor's futures, 77. John from Coventry emails in, says, quote, the Dow, negative 633 on the Dow. And the VIX out again, four big figures, 28.08. Uh, Credit Suisse right now, a new low, 1.58. Good morning. Keeping you up to date with the news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Syrian President Bashar al-Assad is meeting with Russian counterpart Vladimir Putin in Moscow today as the Kremlin pushes for a Syria-Turkey reconciliation. Russia will also host four-way talks involving Turkey, Syria and Iran. And the potential deal opposed by the U.S. comes after China brokered a diplomatic detente between Iran and Saudi Arabia, demonstrating its newfound weight in the region. China reports a rebound in consumer spending, industrial output, and investment this year. The National Bureau of Statistics says retail sales rose 3.5 percent in January and February, compared to the same period last year. Industrial output rose 2.4 percent. However, the unemployment rate increased, pointing to a weakness in domestic demand. About half a million British workers are striking today as unions stage a mass walkout. Time to disrupt Chancellor of the Exchequer Jeremy Hunt's annual budget. Teachers, junior doctors, civil servants and workers on the London Underground are expected to join picket lines with rallies and marches planned near Downing Street and the Houses of Parliament. The Capitol subway is effectively shut down over a pension and working conditions dispute. And Apple is delaying bonuses for some corporate divisions and expanding a cost-cutting effort. Bloomberg has learned it will reduce the frequency of bonuses for a portion of Apple's corporate workers. Now, separately, the company is limiting hiring and leaving additional positions open when employees leave. 
Managers are also reportedly checking office attendance and curbing travel. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. I'm wondering whether you would be open to assisting further if there was another call for additional liquidity from Credit Suisse. The answer is absolutely not, for many reasons, outside the simplest reason, which is regulatory and statutory. We now own 9.8% um, of the bank. If we go above 10%, all kinds of new rules kick in, whether it be by our regulator or the European regulator or the Swiss regulator and we're not inclined to get into a new regulatory regime. An interview heard around the Credit Suisse world. Youssef Gamal Aldin of Bloomberg shaking bank foundations this morning with the comments of Saudi National Bank chairman uh, here on their commitment near 10% to Credit Suisse. I won't review the stock over the last two hours, but Lisa Bramwitz and I, with our good guests coming up here, will continue to monitor a stock that can't find a bid. Moments ago, Lisa, 1.573, so distant from where you think American regulators would step in. And when you take a look at the credit side, you could see that the yields now on their perpetual bonds are 13%, almost 14%. <clears throat> That's the implied wow. yield based on where that. the price is yeah. going. It's distressed level, how much more do we see as people try to figure out what's going right. to be left for the investors if there is a profitability at the very least kind of problem? The global ramifications, folks. Uh, Amy, help me here as you can with the charts on radio. I'll describe it. Futures negative 82 on SPX. Dow futures negative 656. NASDAQ is behind. Less of a decline, one, negative 1.7%. Uh, and we're approaching five big figures on the VIX, getting back near 30, 28.33. With bank ramifications, uh, we will go to Gina Martin-Adams in a moment. But first of all, on the charm offenses, offensive, the charm offensive of Swiss CEO of uh, Credit Suisse, Shanali Basek, our chief financial crisis correspondent, steps in this morning. There is a geography from Cabot Square in London to New York down at the bottom of Madison Avenue, which is the heritage of Credit Suisse. How fractured are they this morning? Listen, the interesting thing here is that Credit Suisse has been fractured for a very, very long time. So the interesting thing here is the fact that it's been bleeding for so long is actually what makes it, Tom, less jarring to see moves like today. But the systemic risk question that is underpinning the Credit Suisse question Classic risk question here. What is the floor? When you heard the comments from the Saudi National Bank here, it's a regulatory one. It's a, it's a technical question here. It's not a crisis of confidence here, but it is a signal that they cannot put more money into this bank at this time. And Lisa, to me, what's so upsetting here is how do you run a bank under $2 a share? I mean, just this, simple as that. How do you get out of this spiral? How do you get confidence <clears throat> if you're saying, wait three years? They don't have necessarily three years, and they're not going to report until next month. I'm looking at the shares of big U.S. banks, which are trading lower in sympathy. And I wonder, the fissure, sort of the, the line, and we were talking about this with Jan Patrick, between uh, something that is a profitability crisis and something that is more of a liquidity issue. At what point are people concerned in the conversations you've had about something that's more than a profitability issue. Coming into last year, we had a lot of bank executives across the globe, frankly, including right here in, in New York City, that were worried, very worried about the systemic risk tied to Credit Suisse. In more recent days, that risk has really gone down. If you think about what happened with Silicon Valley Bank, this was not a globally systemic mm -hmm. financial institution. If you're Credit Suisse, you have the full right. faith and backing of the Swiss government. I think that's the point. That Completely unfair question to you, but it's unfair uh, uh, Wednesday, so go with it. Um, how do you form... Credit Suisse first Boston amid that environment. Could you suggest to me the lunch at one of Daniel Balud's restaurants where you're going to try to recruit somebody over to drive forward on CSFB, the new bank they're trying yeah. to build? I don't get it. There are a lot of questions around the plan here. And you all said the CEO of Credit Suisse just days ago tell you that it won't be before 2025, really, before you see any form of IPO. So if you're bringing on bankers and you want that equity, there's a lot of questions about what that equity will be worth. Tom knows this more than everybody. So recruiting people on, creating a 
plan. They have not brought on more large anchor investors yet, but I will say we know how Wall Street works. The more the price drops, the more that investors <clears throat> get interested in coming in. I think the role of private capital, you've been talking about it, is very interesting, both in the SVB situation as well as Credit Suisse, the swirling of Apollo. All right, okay, okay, come on. I, 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 I got to go here, folks. You know, it's just Chanel. There's only 42 people watching. Could an American bank come in and pick up Credit Suisse for next to nothing this morning? Can I tell you, in the 10 years I've covered this, that has always been the worry in Switzerland that there would be an American bank that would want to expand abroad and buy a big risk a wealth manager. Now there are too many worries, Tom, about okay. the risks inside of Credit Suisse. They are worried about everything from risk controls to KYC. So to you're clients. reporting as it's less likely. It is less likely. Okay, fine. Shanali Basik, don't be a stranger. You are no. terrific and well-versed in this, and I'm curious how the dynamics and the <clears throat> conversations you have at the C-suite change over time. On the broader market, we are seeing some of the declines accelerate, despite the fact that we are seeing rate hikes priced out of the market. Gina Martin-Adams of Bloomberg Intelligence, we are so lucky uh, to have you join us this morning. Gina, I'm curious what your takeaway is from some of the fragilities in the financial system and how it's being borne through the rest of the equity uh, complex. Well, I think we've learned over time, Lisa, that predicting fear is uh, really a fool's game. I think what we are right in right now is an environment of fear, and fear can take asset values uh, down to levels that no one can predict. So I think it's really difficult to say. You know, our best case, our, our, our best case is really framed by a combination of fundamentals and technicals, and unfortunately, the technicals that were really empowering <coughs> the market since October's low have broken down pretty significantly because of the fear that has evolved around the financial sector. We've seen the S&P 500 break through critical support levels. We've seen right. a lot of sort of optimism really dismantled over the last several weeks. And the result is, you know, uh, there's not a, a right. great reason to be a hero here. You've got to find a place where you can find some deep value emerging in segments of the market where you can see a sustainable okay. long-term uh, I, I get, Gina, I get the idea of a search for deep value here, and I know you're looking out at PEs of nine or six or five, whatever it is. I'm making a joke there, folks. But, Gina, the fact of the matter is people are revaluing and pricing and growthiness, persistent free cash flow, and, and the idea that there are selected companies that dominate within their sectors. Are they going to be repriced on a price-to-earnings basis by price or by increasing earnings? Yeah, I, I think this is an excellent point, is what are investors going to be willing to pay for in this kind of environment? And right now, they're not willing to pay for anything. I mean, the, I think this is the, the problem that you run into in an environment where fear really takes over the equity <clears throat> market is, uh, at a certain point, valuations actually become more attractive. But when you're looking at an index that was trading at 16 times earning on an equal, equal, earnings on an equal weighted basis, and the earnings outlook is still so uncertain, you really are taking a flyer on the S&P 500 right now. And that's a really difficult proposition. I think there are segments of the index that have very little exposure to what happens with financials and to the degree that you can right. look through some of the fear and see earnings trends emerging. We are at a point in the cycle where earnings are probably reaching their lows over the next quarter or two. And that means that if you can think through where the dynamics of growth are gonna emerge for 2024, and back that into evaluation, there is a case for stocks in certain segments of the index. But certainly are the banks touchable right now? I right. you know I'd be a fool to argue that they are. They're, you know, not a portion right. of our portfolio and haven't well, been for months because of the dynamics of this space. Gina, we gotta run, but just massive shout out to Herman Chan. I know you never speak to him. He shakes when he talks to you, but your bank analyst on regionals, Herman Chan and his team have been just absolutely superb the last couple of days. Gina Martin Adams driving equities for Bloomberg Intelligence uh, this morning. And Shanali Basic, I should mention as well, our chief financial crisis uh, correspondent. Lisa, your thoughts as we stagger to the nine o'clock hour. That what we thought might be subsiding yesterday and even earlier this morning when we came in is very very much still on the table, and that is financial system <clears throat> risk that is taking the priority, at least in the market's view, and potentially right. for the ECB tomorrow and uh, <clears throat> the Federal Reserve uh, tomorrow, uh, next week, excuse me. I'm looking right now at two-year yields around the world cratering, going to the lowest levels that we've seen September, September of last year, no. even as we get signs of an <clears throat> ongoing robust economy. At what point do these conflicts, right. these conflicting goals of central banks come out with something that can... Uh, 
to try to ease some of the panic. I will leave you with technical analysis, which, as Lisa knows, really, really works on radio. I just can't say how much that works. Credit Suisse this morning has been extremely well behaved. That is technical talk. Think Chris Verone, who's wonderful at this over at Strategus. It is waltzed along a declining moving average within a big five fancy study of trend. The trend is south right now. There have been any number of times in the 7 o'clock hour and even right now where we're trying to lift above that and we are struggling to do that. There is a dearth of selling right now versus earlier, but critically, off of Youssef's interview with the Saudi leadership earlier today, the buyers of Credit Suisse are on strike. Coming up with John Farrow on television, Julian Emanuel to drive the conversation forward. Good morning.